So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to uh, each one of you. It's great to be online and uh, great for everyone who's joining us. Welcome. Um, we are all online today to be uh, um, starting a conversational debate, which is uh, presented by the South African Debate Initiative. Uh, my name is Dave Gilchrist, uh, based in Australia, and I'm delighted to be moderating today's debate. Um, our topic today is in the form of a question, is the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 a reference to Christ? And I'd like to start off by introducing our speakers today. So firstly, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Shabir Ali. Um, good evening, Shabir in Canada. Good evening. It's great to, great to see you again. Thank you for all your preparation and for being part of this debate. Thanks for hosting us. Thanks uh, to all of you gentlemen for welcoming me to have this discussion with you. Shabir Ali holds a MA and a PhD degree in Quranic interpretation from the University of Toronto and a BA in religious studies from Laurentian University. Um, he has taught courses at the University of Toronto on the Arabic language, Islamic studies and interfaith relations. As a faith leader, he explains his faith on a weekly television program called Let the Quran Speak. He often represents Islam in public lectures and interfaith dialogues. It's great to have you, Shabir. Good to be here. Uh, secondly, uh, introducing uh, Samuel Green. Uh, good morning, Samuel. It's great to have you for, from Australia. Thank you, David. It's great to be here with everyone. Samuel Green became a Christian while at uh, university and has been involved in various Christian ministries. Uh, since 1999, he's worked with the Australian Fellowship of Evangelical Students as a campus evangelist and Islamic engagement director. He is a writer for the Answering Islam website and is an Anglican interfaith chaplain. Engaging with Islam is one of Samuel's main interests, and he does this through writing, through training, evangelism, lectures, and debates. And Samuel has degrees in theology and chemical engineering. Uh, welcome, Samuel. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, uh, Yusuf uh, Ismail. Yusuf, it's great to have you. A very good early morning in South Africa there. Good morning, Dave. And good morning to all you fine gentlemen. And salam Thanks, alaikum. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for joining us so early there in South Africa. Yusuf Ismail is a trial court criminal defense lawyer based in South Africa and operating in the courts in the rural regions of KwaZulu-Natal, where he provides legal services and is a trial court defense counsel to the indigent. He considers himself a student on religion in general, with a specific emphasis on Islam and Christianity. He is the founder of South African Debate Initiative, which focuses on hosting and initiating debates and conversations on religion and contemporary issues. He has been debating um, Christian apologists and preachers for more than a decade. Um, he has a degree in commerce and law. And Yusuf mentioned to me that uh, one of his most memorable engagements was debating John Gilchrist, who incidentally is my dad, uh, way back in 2011 and hosting a series of debates between him and Dr. Shabir back in 2009. Uh, welcome, uh, Yusuf. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here. Great. And then we also have uh, introducing Dr. Jonathan McClatchy. Um, good evening, Jonathan. It's great to have you. Good evening. Great to be here. Thanks so much for having me back on with you guys. <laughs> Dr. Jonathan McClatchy is a Christian writer, international speaker, debater, assistant professor at Sattler College in Boston, and also a fellow of the Discovery Institute. He holds a bachelor's degree with honors in forensic biology, a master's degree in evolutionary biology, a second master's degree in medical and molecular bioscience, and a PhD in evolutionary biology. He's also working on his MA in biblical studies at Southern Evangelical Seminary. Uh, Jonathan has participated in dozens of moderated debates around the world with representatives of atheism, Islam, and other alternative worldview perspectives. He's also the founder of TalkAboutDoubts.com, a ministry that seeks to disciple Christians who are struggling with doubts regarding the veracity of the gospel. 
Jonathan has spoken internationally in Europe, in North America, South Africa, and Asia, promoting an intelligent, reflective, and evidence-based Christian faith. Welcome, Jonathan. Thanks so much for having me on. It's great to be here. Great. So let's go straight into the structure of this uh, conversational debate. So I'll just quickly outline the structure. We're going to be starting with uh, opening statements of 20 minutes each, first from Samuel and then from Shabir. Um, then we will move into opening statements of 12 minutes each from firstly Jonathan and then uh, Yusuf. We'll then have uh, first rebuttal of 10 minutes each, first uh, Samuel and then uh, Shabir. Then a second rebuttal, which is seven minutes each. First, Jonathan, then Yusuf. Uh, we will then have a cross-examination time, which will be Samuel and Jonathan spending 10 minutes asking Shabir and Yusuf um, questions. And then we'll have um, Shabir and Yusuf spending the next 10 minutes asking Samuel and Jonathan questions. We will then move into closing statements of three minutes each, where Yusuf would go first, Jonathan second, and then we would have closing statements of five minutes each, first Shabir and finally Samuel. So we're looking forward to a great conversational debate um, today. And uh, of course, the focus of the debate is on Isaiah 53. Um, so I think it would be relevant and important to be um, reading through this particular chapter of the Bible first um, before we actually get into the discussions. So. Um, let me start us off by just reading through the entire chapter of Isaiah 53. So starting at verse 1. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his, of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So that is Isaiah 53. We're now going to move into the debate itself. And we're going to start off with opening statements of 20 minutes each from Samuel and then Shabir. Uh, my understanding is that both gentlemen have slides, so I'm going to pull up their slides. Um, but let me first uh, start off by once again welcoming Samuel. Samuel, you'll have 20 minutes to go first with your opening statements, and let me know when you'd like me to pull up your slides. Okay. Um, 
Sorry, Dave. Yeah, that's it. Great. Thank you. Well, hello and welcome, everyone. I want to uh, thank Yusuf, Shabir and Jonathan for being part of this debate today and David for moderating. And I want to thank all of you viewers who are watching. And I hope that everyone who views what happens today, that they will find it helpful. The subject of the debate today is, is the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 a reference to, to Jesus, to the Christ, to the Messiah? Now, why would Christians and Muslims want to discuss this question? The answer is that Isaiah 53 is a prophecy written before Jesus, which Christians claim confirms the message that Jesus died for our sins and was raised to life. Muslim leaders, on the other hand, disagree with this. And so we have our question today. Is the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 a reference to Christ? Is it a reference to Jesus? I will be answering that Jesus is the suffering servant and my presentation will attempt to give the big picture of Isaiah and the Bible with the three following points. And I will move to my slides now. So my structure is I'm going to look at what do the verses say? What's their content? Uh, the servant and the Messiah in the book of Isaiah. And then finally, Jesus is the suffering servant. So let's move to the first of these. What do the verses say? Well, the first thing to note is that the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 is the content of a message that will be proclaimed to the nations. So he will sprinkle the nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. What they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So Isaiah 53 is a message about a suffering servant that will be proclaimed to the nations. Now, this message of, about the suffering servant is introduced as good news. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace and brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Now, the Hebrew word here for good news is the word gospel. This is the Old Testament word for gospel. This is the word where this is where the word gospel comes from. Therefore, Isaiah 53 is the gospel message about the suffering servant that will be proclaimed among the nations. Now, Isaiah 53 is a message about a servant who dies in verses 11 and 12, sorry, 9 and 12, and is raised to life in verse 11. But his death is described in sacrificial priestly terms. So there's the idea of the sprinkling of blood that we find amongst the priests. So shall he sprinkle many nations. His life, his sacrifice is described as a guilt offering. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering. And so he's described as, as the priestly language of, of sprinkling and a sacrifice. And then finally as intercession. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So here we have this priestly language of sprinkling sacrifice and intercession and we're told that this is god's salvation and how uh, how forgiveness is going to come so in summary isaiah 53 is a prophecy about the gospel which will be proclaimed to the nations this gospel is a message about the suffering servant who has died as a sacrifice for sin has been raised to the dead and now provides intercession and righteousness for sinners so who is the suffering servant? Is the servant the Christ, the Messiah? I want to now look at the book of Isaiah and how it explains who this person is. So first of all, I want to begin by looking at the Messiah in the book of um, Isaiah. There are two references here. In Isaiah 9, we see uh, one of the famous references. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And notice what it says in the underlined section of his of the increase of his government and of the peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it. So there is a Messiah coming, a son of David, who will bring the everlasting kingdom of God, the Messianic age. Isaiah 11 is another reference to a, prophe a prophecy of the Messiah. 
In this one, which is a bit longer, and I've just summarized it here, the Messiah is anointed with the Spirit of God. He is pleasing to God. He brings judgment, a new creation, the knowledge of God to the earth, and gathers the nations to worship God. My point simply here is that in the in Isaiah, there is uh, this coming messianic figure who's going to bring the, the messianic age. Now, who is the Messiah and the Christ? Is it Hezekiah? Hezekiah is, uh, he, he comes at the end of the first section of Isaiah's prophecies, and he is a son of David. And there is a great salvation from the Assyrians under him. But it's only a short-term salvation. There is no everlasting kingdom, no new creation, no spirit of God, no worship of the nations. In fact, Hezekiah is more concerned about himself in the end. If you read that uh, underlined section there, the word of the Lord that you have spoken is good, said Hezekiah, uh, for he thought there will be peace and security in my days. The prophet Isaiah told Hezekiah about the coming judgment and Hezekiah's only concern was really for himself. And so he's not he, he's presented as being not the fulfillment of the Messiah. The next potential Messiah is someone who's called the Messiah, and that is Cyrus. Uh, we read this, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to loose the belt of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. And so Isaiah says that God raised up the, the Persian king Cyrus and, and he, he's given the title of the Messiah, the anointed. However, this is not the fulfillment of Isaiah 9 and 11 either, because while there is a, a return and a redemption, there's no new creation, no spirit of God, and no worship of all the nations. Now, in summary, Isaiah tells us that there is a Messiah who will come and be the anointed with the spirit of God, who will bring the messianic age, the new creation, uh, judgment, and the knowledge of God, and for people to worship God all over the earth. He shows us that it's not Hezekiah or Cyrus, but instead goes on to introduce us to the servant of the Lord. There are four songs with the servant of the Lord. And so I want us to see how this phrase, the servant of the Lord, is used. The first is in Isaiah 42. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice for the nations. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you and will give you as a covenant for the peoples, a light for the nations. So here we see that the servant is well pleasing to God in the same way that the Messiah is well pleasing to God in 11. He's the spirit anointed servant as the Messiah is the spirit anointed servant in 11. And this servant is a covenant for Israel and the, and the nations. And we actually see this in Isaiah uh, 55 for the Messiah as well. Now, Isaiah 42 also talks about another servant. The nationals, uh, it talks about national Israel. And it makes it clear that there's a difference between these servants. It says, hear you deaf and look you blind that you may see. Who is blind but my servant or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who, who is blind as my dedicated one or blind as the servant of the Lord? And so we see here that Isaiah 42 also shows us the failure of national Israel with whom God is not pleased. So Isaiah 42 has two servants, the true Israel described in the same way as the Messiah in Isaiah 11 and the faithless nation. Now, Isaiah 49 verse uh, Isaiah 49 has the second servant song. And let me just read to you some of this. And now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring back Jacob to him and that Israel might be gathered. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord and my God has become my strength. He said, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So here we see that this servant has a ministry to Israel and specifically to the remnant of Israel. He will gather Israel and its remnant 
and be a light to the nations, just as the Messiah is in Isaiah 11. And again, we see that this, this servant is going to be rejected by national Israel. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers. Let's go to Isaiah 50 now, the third song. And again, this begins with the national, with national Israel's failure. Uh, behold, for your, uh, for your iniquities you were sold, and for your transgressions your mother was sent away. And so it begins with faithless Israel, but then it introduces the faithful servant, who interestingly is a, a prophet. The Lord has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with the word him who is weary. You can see how this is building upon that the spirit that is given to the to the servant in Isaiah 42. Now, what we see is that the faithful servant again suffers. I gave my back to those who strike, who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out my beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. And then, very interestingly, national Israel is warned to listen to the faithful servant. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Let him who walks in the darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Behold, all you who kindle the fire, who equip yourselves with burning torches, walk by the light of your fire and by the torches you have kindled. This is uh, this you have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. And so we see that Israel is not to seek its own light, but the light of this servant. Now, these three songs tell us about the servant of the Lord. They tell us that national Israel is the servant, but has failed in her mission. However, the Lord will raise up a true servant, a true Israelite, the faithful remnant who will actually serve the remnant, who will fulfill Israel's mission, but will suffer in doing so. This servant is described in the same way as the Messiah is in Isaiah 11. So in summary, Isaiah tells us to wait for the Messiah and then he introduces us to this servant. This is the servant we meet in Isaiah 53. The suffering servant of Isaiah 53 is identified in the co large context of the book as the Messiah. Now, this idea of the suffering Messiah, oh, sorry, the suffering servant, this idea that that the suffering servant is the Messiah is not just a Christian idea. It's actually the traditional Jewish idea as well. So in the Isaiah Targum, which is a translation into Aramaic and, and an explanation of the text says, Behold, my servant, the anointed one, the Messiah, shall prosper. He shall be exalted and increase and be very strong. And so we see there that when the Jews translated the, the uh, Isaiah into uh, Aramaic, they identified as the servant of Isaiah 53 as the Messiah. Now, in the Talmud here, I'm not going to read all of this in the Talmud. You've got the reference. But in this, they gather together the names of the Messiah from the scriptures. And you'll notice in the last one that one of the names that the Talmud gives to the Messiah comes from Isaiah 53 verse 4. And so in rabbinic literature, Isaiah 53 is seen as um, referring to the Messiah. And then with Maimonides, I've tried to give a, a range of different examples here. With Maimonides, we see uh, him writing about the Messiah. He says, similarly, Isaiah referring to the arrival of the Messiah uh, implies that neither his father nor mother nor his kith nor kin will be known, for he will shoot up right forth as a sapling and as a root out of dry ground. And he's quoting there from Isaiah 53. So this is actually the historic Jewish understanding of the person of Isaiah 53, and it's the Christian understanding too. So again, this is the un uh, who is the suffering servant of Isaiah 53? Well, it's, it's the Christ. Now, I'm going to switch over to my uh, notes here. So if you can just put me in the middle screen, please. If you can just switch me across, David, because I don't, uh, okay, maybe you just want to make me the, the single screen. Now, my third point is that Jesus is the Messiah and the suffering servant. Now, we see this in the gospel story because 
at Jesus' baptism, God says, with him, I am well pleased. And these are the words we see in Isaiah 11 and in Isaiah 42. And then we see that as Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, that the Holy Spirit comes upon him. And so it's very clear in the Gospels that Jesus is this anointed Messiah with whom God is well pleased, who who is this sufferer, who is this servant? These references from Isaiah are being used of Jesus at this point. Jesus then goes out into the desert for 40 days in the desert, just as Israel went into the desert for 40 years. But whereas Israel sinned and disobeyed God in the desert for that time, Jesus is shown to be sinless. And this is how the gospel begins, by showing his 40 days in the desert. And by doing this, it's showing that Jesus is the true Israelite, the true servant. He then sp speaks about the gospel and starts preaching the gospel. Now, as I said, Isaiah is not just a prophecy about the servant. It's a prophecy as well about the coming gospel. And this is what Jesus does. He preaches the gospel. We see as we read that Jesus suffered uh, suffers death and was raised from the dead, as Isaiah 53 said the Messiah would be. His resurrection confirms that he is the true and faithful servant of God. And the gospel message promised in Isaiah about the suffering servant has, in fact, been preached to the world. And so Jesus is the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. Well, to conclude... Today, we are considering whether the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 is Jesus. As we have seen, uh, the prophecy of Isaiah 53 is about the gospel, which will be proclaimed to the nations. This gospel is a message about the suffering servant who has died as a sacrifice for sin, has been raised from the dead, and now provides intercession and righteousness for sinners. Then we saw that the fulfillment of the Messiah is not Hezekiah or Cyrus, but the servant of the Lord. And Isaiah tells us to expect the Messiah and then introduces us to the servant of the Lord, who he describes as the Messiah. This servant is described as the true Israelite, the faithful remnant who serves the faithful remnant, who fulfills Israel's mission both to Israel and to the nations. And as I said, he's described in the way that the Messiah is in chapter 11. This actually agrees uh, with the traditional understanding that Isaiah 53 is, sorry, yeah, th this agrees with the traditional Jewish understanding that Isaiah 53 is about the Messiah. For these reasons, the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 is Jesus. This uh, is, has been fulfilled by him through his life and mission and it's confirmed and explained to us as we read the prophecy of Isaiah 53. In fact, I would say that only Jesus is the only possible candidate for this. And if you don't accept it as Jesus, then who is it? Who is it? I just want to finish by saying this prophecy gives me great confidence in the truthfulness of what I read about Jesus, of what I hear about his life, because I can go back and look at these scriptures and read them in their context and see that the life, death and resurrection and salvation of Jesus was foretold by God in the prophets beforehand. And I want you to, I ask you, I invite you to consider these things. Consider this as you consider the word of God. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Samuel, for your opening statement. Um, I'm now going to hand over to uh, Shabir, who is going to have 20 minutes um, for his opening statement. And Shabir, let me know when you'd like me to bring up your slides. Sure. Um, so I begin in the uh, name of God, the Beneficent, the Merciful One. I say uh, peace be with you all. And I ask God to bless uh, all of us here tonight. I ask God to bless all of his righteous servants of all time, including all of his prophets, uh, his messengers, and all of the righteous uh, people. So Dave, please uh, bring up uh, the slides. So I'm so delighted that uh, I'm here in this uh, forum with uh, these uh, august uh, gentlemen uh, to share thoughts and to, and to listen and to learn. So my approach to the question is like this. Is Isaiah uh, 53 about uh, Jesus Christ? Uh, 
Uh, I would say, first of all, that Muslims uh, believe in Jesus. We believe him to be uh, God's Messiah. Uh, the term Messiah is not defined in the Quran, uh, but uh, we, uh, we know that uh, um, Messiah can mean a priest, a prophet, or a king. Um, so Jesus could have been any one of these uh, from the Quranic point of view, a priest, a prophet, or a king. Um, but can Muslims accept that uh, maybe he died for uh, anyone's sins? Uh, the answer to that uh, will be no. Um, so let's, let's continue. The New Testament presents Jesus as a pre prophet, as a priest, and as a Davidic Messiah, as the Div Davidic Messiah, and therefore as a king Messiah. But clearly he was not a king. Christians say that he will be king when he returns. Moreover, the New Testament depicts Jesus as a fulfillment not only of uh, uh, Isaiah 53, but also a host of other Old Testament prophecies. But while conservative Christians continue to toe that line, many commentaries on the Bible today written by Christians steer away from linking uh, Isaiah 53 with Jesus. What went wrong? Let me clarify that there are many conservative Christian scholars who, in their interpretation of the Old Testament, start with their belief in the New Testament. Uh, for them, it is a done deal that the New Testament confirms the Old. Uh, then uh, there are hypercritical scholars such as Robert Price for whom Jesus never existed. I I'm not interested in advancing the claims of hypercritical or atheist scholars, but I'm just mentioning that this is the spectrum that is out there. However, uh, there are many Christian scholars who take a two-stage approach to interpreting the Old Testament. In the first stage, they are willing to suspend their belief in the New Testament while exploring the grammar and context, both textual and historical, of the Old. At a secondary stage, that would be their stage two uh, of interpretation, they can then say that even though the text and context did not have Jesus in mind, the Christian interpreter can nonetheless see Jesus as the fulfillment of Isaiah 53. But there are reasons why many New Testament scholars, uh, even Christians, uh, would not even go to that second stage. And thus, I see many commentaries on Isaiah 53 with no reference to Jesus. Again, what went wrong? At first, many scholars recognize that some of the events recorded in the New Testament were deliberately fashioned to be a fulfillment of Isaiah 53 and other Old Testament passages. Writing thus about uh, Jesus, the New Testament writers did two things. Uh, first, they made it look like uh, it, a done deal that Jesus is a fulfillment of the Old Testament. Second, they developed the theory of atonement uh, through the blood sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. These two factors uh, made it difficult for Christians to see Isaiah 53 as anything but a prediction about Jesus. I'll address these two points in turn. Let's take an example of how the New Testament writers uh, made it look like Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament. Mark's gospel says, at noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, at chapter 15, verse 33. But according to uh, John Dominic Crossan, this is not an event that was remembered and passed down. Rather, it was a story made up on the basis of an Old Testament passage that has nothing to do with the crucifixion scene. The passage reads, in that day, declares the sovereign Lord, Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. That's Amos chapter 8, verse 9. Crossan argues, especially in this book, Who Killed Jesus, uh, that the above uh, is an example in which, uh, um, and, and he shows many more, uh, in which the details of the crucifixion are not history memorized, but prophecy is historicized. In other words, the New Testament writers took what they see as prophecies about Jesus, and they wrote his story to match the prophecies. Now, the New Testament scholar Mark Goodacre, in this book, The New Testament and the Church, argues that uh, Crossan's claim is too strong. Rather, Goodacre holds that the early Christians did remember some genuine tradition, but in the process of transmission, those traditions were attached to what were seen as prophecies and even modified in view of those prophecies. So Goodacre prefers to say that the tradition was scripturalized. Uh, Goodacre adds that many conservative scholars accept the tradition uh, that the tradition was modified in this way. For example, Raymond Brown in his book, Death of the Messiah, accepts that the Amos passage may have given rise to the symbolism in Mark's statement that the sun went dark from 12 to 3 p.m. while Jesus was on the cross. Uh, 
The conservative scholar, Joel Marcus, who debated with me in Glasgow many years ago, uh, takes a similarly balanced view when he writes, the early Christians remembered certain details about Jesus' death because they believed them uh, to have been prophesied in the scriptures. Once, having made the connection with the scriptures, however, they discovered other related Old Testament passages that, in their view, must have been fulfilled in his death as well. And so they created narratives in which they were fulfilled. That's uh, in the book, The Old Testament and the Death of Jesus. Uh, and uh, uh, that's his article, The Old Testament and the Death of Jesus, uh, in the book, The Death of Jesus in Early Christianity. And the book is shown here. The balanced position of Goodacre, Brown, and Marcus uh, helps us to understand why the Gospels, in trying to prove that Jesus fulfilled scripture, uh, does not go all the way in inventing episodes to match the supposed prophecies precisely. In this way, we can see that Matthew chapter 8, verse 7, links Jesus's healing of people with Isaiah 53, 4. Yet the Isaiah passage in context refers to someone who was suffering, not, not someone who was healing others. A, a curious example of the New Testament use of the Old Testament to construct scenes is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where Jesus was silent at times during his trial. Of course, in John's gospel, Jesus spoke powerfully and at length, even during the trial. So John does not claim that Jesus was ever silent. And given the synoptic gospels, uh, and, and even the synoptic gospels have him uh, making bold statements, even if after a moment of silence. <laughs> What's going on? Now, the, as Randall Helms pointed out in his book, Gospel Fictions, the Synoptic Gospels were trying to portray Jesus as fulfilling Isaiah 53, 7, which speaks of the servant being silent as he is being led like a lamb to the slaughter. Of course, we know that the metaphor of a sheep being silent as it is led to the slaughter means that he will never protest. Jesus, on the other hand, did speak up, especially in John, and somewhat in the Synoptics. Uh, thus, we see here two strands of tradition in tension. Uh, one is the genuine strand that Jesus spoke up. The other is the claim that he was uh, silent as a, as a lamb. To go back to Crossan's terms, uh, is the tradition that Jesus was silent history memorized? Did someone, uh, did some eyewitness remember precisely that Jesus was silent uh, in response to one question and then he answered uh, the next question? Or is it prophecy historicized? Uh, did someone notice Isaiah's uh, statement about the lamb being led to the slaughter and, thinking that this applies to Jesus, insert the remark that Jesus was silent? Or, to use the more balanced term of Goodacre, was the tradition that Jesus spoke up at his trial scripturalized to include mention that he didn't speak? Such detailed studies of the tradition led uh, scholars to realize that the New Testament writers made it look as if Jesus fulfilled the prophecies. By doing so, the New Testament writers also made it difficult for us to see Isaiah as it is. The other factor that makes it difficult for Christians to see other than Jesus in Isaiah 53 is the developed stories of atonement which uh, Christians uh, adopted. When we read passages like, for he bore the sin of many in Isaiah 53, 12, we cannot help but think uh, of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. But is the atonement a necessary understanding of Isaiah? As the New Testament scholar Morna Hooker pointed out, uh, Jesus himself does not appear to have read Isaiah in that way. And perhaps Paul was the first person to link Isaiah 53 with Christian atonement theories. Uh, that's uh, in Jesus and the Suffering Servant, edited by Bellinger and Farmer. Uh, uh, Hooker's uh, essay is in that book. Hooker pointed out that during his ministry, Jesus proclaimed the forgiving love of God, which welcomed repentant sinners back without condition, thus rendering particular acts of atonement unnecessary. That's on page 100. She added that the servant in Isaiah suffers not instead of the people, but alongside the people. And this is apparently how the writers in the New Testament saw it, except perhaps Paul. Paul has a more uh, sophisticated understanding, which uh, will take time to unpack. I skip over that for the moment. In sum, as scholars have had to free their minds of the New Testament associations and read Isaiah with a clear view of its history and context. The results of such a contextual reading may surprise uh, many conservative Christians. For example, 
On the question of whether or not the servant dies, the New Jerome Biblical Commentary explaining Isaiah 53, 9 uh, states that this does not necessarily imply the death of the servant. Why? Uh, because identical language is used in several other biblical passages without implying death. That's in the New Jerome Biblical Commentary, page 342. Norman Wybray, in his uh, commentary on 2nd Isaiah, uh, explains further uh, this point. He says, even he, he writes that even the expressions taken away and cut off from the land of the living uh, may, inf may, may refer simply to confinement in prison. The, the preparation of the grave in, in verse 9 probably refers not to actual burial, uh, but to the gleeful anticipation of the prophet's death by his enemies. The phrase in his death in the same verse is now universally regarded as a corrupt reading and poured out his life to death uh, in verse 12 probably means uh, risked his life rather than died. That's on page 76. You can see that Norman Wybray is taking the view that uh, it is the prophet uh, who himself is the, is the uh, suffering servant, the prophet at the uh, 700 years uh, or uh, some 500 years before Jesus uh, during the Babylonian uh, exile. Uh, what about the mention of a sacrifice for sin in verse 12? Wybery explains the statement that the servant became a sacrificial victim, the Asham, uh, the sin offering, has greatly influenced Christological interpretation of the servant. But the whole of the first part of this verse is extremely corrupt in the Hebrew and virtually unintelligible. It would be wrong to base any serious conclusions about the role of the servant on it. That's on it in this book, pages 77 to 78. Wybray continues, if in fact it did make the servant into a human sacrifice acceptable to Yahweh by equating him with an animal sacrifice, this will be totally contrary to the principles of the religion of Yahweh as understood in the Old Testament. Uh, so I, I will leave it to my colleague Yusuf uh, to go into more uh, details with the verse-by-verse -verse analysis to show why Isaiah 53 does not uh, refer to Jesus. Uh, but for the moment... Let me address the question of who the servant is, if not Jesus. That's a question which uh, Reverend Samuel has already uh, put to us. Uh, scholars offer a wide variety of views. Some view the servant as a collective, either Israel uh, as a whole or a righteous few among the Israelites. Other scholars think the servant is an individual person. A variety of persons have been suggested, and we can see that in the Eerdmans uh, commentary uh, on, on the Bible, uh, which uh, on page uh, 535 says that, in fact, it was Hezekiah, uh, King Hezekiah. Now, King Hezekiah was sick and God healed him, uh, granting him an extension on life so that he could see his offspring. Uh, now, I know that uh, Reverend Samuel said, no, it couldn't have been Hezekiah, and he has his interpretation, uh, but we're relying here on, um, on, on biblical scholars who write uh, massive commentaries on the Bible. Uh, surely they must know what they're talking about, and I'm sure that Reverend Samuel uh, has a right to his interpretation as well. Uh, but, but I don't have to defend King Hezekiah as the particular servant, because there's so many different views, and uh, scholars have held different views, have changed their views within their lifetimes and so on. Uh, so I'll explain why this uh, is it, it, why why this happens. Uh, but for the moment, let me continue. Many scholars think that the individual servant was uh, the prophet they call Second Isaiah whom they regard as the author of chapters 40 to 55 of Isaiah. Now, uh, Reverend uh, uh, Samuel uh, did point out to the, um, uh, the, the tripartite division and, and uh, recognize Second Isaiah as, uh, as a group. I believe he did that, uh, from which he got the four servant uh, songs. Now, um, oh yes, he mentioned the four servant songs. He, I don't know if he said Second Isaiah, but that's that's how uh, the the text is analyzed nowadays in academia. Uh, some such scholars think that Isaiah fifty three, being the last of the four servant songs in uh, Second Isaiah, uh, was composed and inserted into the corpus by the prophet's disciples, probably the author of the section uh, scholars thir call Third Isaiah which are 50, chapters 56 to uh, 66. But, but this tripartite division is not so um, necessary to my, um, uh, to my approach here, uh, because when we read the passages, even the ones which uh, Samuel uh, read, uh, we will see that uh, these uh, show that uh, the one who is called the servant is actually Israel. 
And uh, so the idea that this is uh, a part within the Israel as a whole, a righteous remnant, for example, or even an individual who lived at the time, uh, not necessarily somebody coming hundreds of years later, uh, namely Jesus, uh, all of that would fit within uh, what I'm describing without even needing this tripartite division. But the scholarship nowadays has uh, widely accepted this tripartite division, or at least a division between first Isaiah and a second Isaiah. They see a change in theme, uh, content, and context. Now, uh, when Isaiah prophesied, uh, th he prophesied somewhere uh, from about uh, seven, the 700 uh, uh, BC to um, uh, about um, uh, 650 uh, BC. And we can see the Babylonian captivity occurring after that. Uh, with the fall of Jerusalem in 586. And then uh, the Babylonian captivity ended in 538. Uh, so it's about 48 uh, years. It's during that period that the Israelites were suffering in the captivity. And it looks like that is what the uh, second Isaiah is talking about, that suffering there that the Israelites underwent uh, or even the prophet or a remnant within Israel was undergoing. Now, any one of this variety of views is a preferable alternative to the traditional Christian view that Jesus died for the sins of humankind. Because as we said before, that is contrary to the Old Testament, the view uh, that you cannot take an innocent person and kill him uh, for the uh, sins of the uh, of the guilty. Yet it should not be necessary for us to decide on any one of these alternative views. As Harry Orlinsky pointed out in his share of the co-authored book studies in Second Isaiah, the question of the identity of the servant is on our horizon only because Christians misunderstood Isaiah 53 as a reference to Jesus. Part of the problem with identifying the servant is that Isaiah 53 and the rest of Second Isaiah uses a lot of metaphors. The language is often obscure. Take, for example, Isaiah 50, verse 1, which uh, Samuel uh, read without flinching. Uh, here is how it reads. This is what uh, the Lord says. Where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Taken literally, that would mean that God was married to Israel's matriarch, uh, but he was, uh, but in, he has in the meantime put her away. Uh, of course, Jews, Christians, and Muslims would balk at the idea that God had a wife. It just goes to show that you shouldn't always take the Bible literally. So too, when we come to Isaiah 53, there's a lot of obscurity. Now, in my last couple of minutes, look at the big picture. If Isaiah 53 so clearly refers to Jesus dying for the sins of the world, how do we explain these big picture items? During Jesus's lifetime, no character in the gospel stories is shown proclaiming that Jesus is that servant. John's gospel shows in the first chapter that John the Baptist published publicly proclaimed Jesus as the Lamb of God. But even this does not seem to have had any effect on the public. No one comes to Jesus later and says, oh, we know you are uh, the, the Lamb of, of God. The Jewish scribes and teachers of the Torah were constantly haranguing Jesus, looking for ways to confound him. They didn't seem to notice that by trying to get him crucified, they would help him to fulfill the prophecies. Even after the crucifixion, the disciples didn't seem to get it. Even John's gospel says uh, that they didn't know the prophecy yet that Jesus had to rise from the, the dead. In Luke's gospel on the road to Emmaus, Jesus uh, you know, uh, is with his disciples and they proclaim that he was a great prophet. They still didn't get it that he was the fulfillment of Isaiah 53. In Acts of the Apostles, uh, depicting a 30-year period after the crucifixion, eventually in chapter 8, the eunuch asks if Isaiah 53 is the prophet uh, writing about himself or about someone else. How could he even think it might be the prophet if it was a done deal that this is God who came in the flesh and died for the sins of humankind? Uh, How could he, uh, the eunuch even think at this point, it shows that this was not yet a widespread interpretation in the church. Throughout Acts of the Apostles, Paul and the disciples of Jesus faced Jewish uh, adversaries who are zealous for the Torah. They didn't seem to understand that uh, Jesus died for their sins. Even Gamaliel, Paul's teacher, had a wait-and-see attitude. If they succeed, fine. If not, that's fine as, as well. So in short, uh, it, uh, eventually, in 66 CE, the Jews revolted against Rome. They, they were tired of waiting for the uh, Messiah to lead the revolt. And that wasn't successful. But then in 132 CE, uh, Bar Kosva uh, 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 led another 
another uh, revolt, uh, which was partly successful, and the Jews regarded him as the long-awaited Messiah, though he died three years later. So with all of this, I put before you, gentlemen, uh, that Isaiah 53 is not about Jesus. It's about someone else, probably a, a prophet uh, in, in the Babylonian exile, or the Jewish people on the whole, or a remnant within the Jewish people, and God knows best. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Shabir, for your uh, opening statement of 20 minutes. Um, I'm now going to be handing over to um, Jonathan first and then Yusuf for their opening statements, which will be 12 minutes each. So, uh, Jonathan, I'm going to hand over to you to start your 12 minutes. Well, good day to you all. It's great to be with you gentlemen again. Uh, I find it quite remarkable while Shabir was speaking that Shabir appealed to a scholarly authority <clears throat> and noted that well, he must know what he's talking about since he's a scholar who's written a commentary, whereas poor, poor Samuel, he's not, he's not written a commentary, he's not a scholar, and so we should um, take the, the scholar's word for um, the interpretation of Isaiah 53. Well, I, I can do the same thing. I can introduce a plenty of scholars who would agree with Samuel's and my interpretation that Isaiah 53 is about the Messiah. And th indeed, there are scholars with PhDs who publish books and espouse all kinds of um, crazy ideas. Robert Price would be a great um, example, a great case in point. Uh, but we're here tonight, or today, wherever, you, wherever continent you're on, to discuss the actual text to determine who has the better interpretation. And to do that, we need to review the actual arguments uh, in question, not simply as uh, cite authorities. But in any case, in my opening statement, I want to address specifically the most common counterinterpretation to the Messianic interpretation adopted by Samuel and myself, which is that Isaiah 53 concerns uh, national Israel. Um, so one popular argument that's often advanced in support of the contention as I-53 concerns national Israel is that Israel is identified as God's servant in other passages in Isaiah. Um, ironically, though, it's these very passages that actually reveal that the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 cannot possibly be Israel. Now, to find out why, let's turn to each text in turn. So Isaiah 41, for example, in verses 8 and 9, says, But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now, this uh, text reveals that far from being saved by Israel's afflictions, those nations who wage war against Israel will in fact be subject to destruction. Uh, and this point is borne out in other prophetic texts as well. In Jeremiah 30, verse 11, for example, we read, For I am with you to save you, declares the Lord. I will make you, I will make a full end of all the nations among whom I scattered you. But if you, I will not make a full end. I will discipline you in just measure, and I will by no means leave you unpunished. Uh, also, Jeremiah 46, verse 28 says, Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, declares the Lord, for I am with you. I will make a full end of all the nations to which I have driven you. But of you, I will not make a full end. I will discipline you in just measure, and I will by no means leave you unpunished. Another text that's sometimes adduced uh, in support of the contention that Isaiah 53 is about Israel is uh, Isaiah 44. And we read uh, in Isaiah 44, um, in verse 1, it says, but, but now hear, O Jacob, my servant Israel, whom I have chosen. So Israel is identified as God's servant. But if you continue reading and we get to verses 21 through 23, we read, Remember these things, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you, you are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, O forests, and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. Thus we learn that instead of providing atonement for the sins of uh, for, 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 the, for, for the nations. Israel herself requires salvation for her, from her own sins. So on the interpretation that the servant is Israel, this text does not comport well with what we read in Isaiah 53, verse 9, which says, And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, though he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. It also doesn't comport well with verse 11, which says, Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Indeed, Isaiah had said elsewhere, in Isaiah 6, for example, he says, Woe is me, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the king, Lord of hosts. And yet we find here concerning the servant in Isaiah 53 that there is no deceit in his mouth. How does one square that with the um, most common counterinterpretation that we hear offered? Another text uh, is Isaiah 45, 4. Um, 
where um, where we read, uh, for the sake of my servant, Jacob, um, so there's that um, servant designation again, and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me, um, which is referring to Cyrus. Um, um, so, um, but we read in verse 17, um, uh, the, but Israel is saved by the Lord with everlasting salvation. You shall not be put to shame or confounded to all eternity. Verse 21 of that same chapter says, declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a savior. There is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth. I am God and there is no other. So we see from these texts that Israel is, is no better than the other nations. Since Israel, just like all the other nations, is in need of salvation by God. Uh, Isaiah 48 verse 20 is another text that sometimes comes up in this discussion, um, is, which says, go out from Babylon, flee from Chaldea, declare this with a shout of joy, proclaim it, send it out to the ends of the earth. Say, the Lord has redeemed his servant, Jacob. But if we read uh, the surrounding verses, look at verse 1 um, of this chapter. Uh, Hear this, O house of Jacob, who are called by the name of Israel, and who came from the waters of Judah, who swear by the name of the Lord, and confess the God of Israel, but not in truth or right. Um, verse 4, because I know that you are obstinate, and your neck is an iron sinew, and your forehead brass. Or, or verse 8 and 9, where it says, you have never heard, you have never known from of old, your ear has not been opened. For I knew that you would surely go treacherously, and that from before birth you were called a rebel. For my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you, that I may not cut you off. And so again, we see that Israel is uh, criticized for their sinfulness and for their rebellion, in contradistinction to the portrayal of the servant in Isaiah 53. Um, I, we come to Isaiah 49. Um, which Samuel has already alluded to for us. Uh, we read, listen to me, O coastlands, give attention to peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named my name. He made my mouth a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow in his quiver. He hid me away. He, he said, you are my servant, Israel, and whom I'll, I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity. It surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me from the womb to be a servant to bring Jacob back to him, that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, it's too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. So in this text, just as Samuel said, Isaiah clearly refers to two Israels, not one. Uh, there is the servant who is identified by the title Israel. And there's also the nation of Israel, who is redeemed and gathered by the first Israel. Um, Isaiah 42, as Samuel also pointed out, even contrasts the righteous servant, the Messiah, with the unrighteous servant, Israel. Look at verses 18 uh, through 20. Hear you deaf, look you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf is my messenger whom I send. Who is blind is my dedicated one, or blind is a servant of the Lord, uh, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> now, that there's also, in, in addition to these challenges, to the identification of the servant in Isaiah 53 as the nation of Israel, there's another problem, which is, if we look at verses 8 and 9 of Isaiah 53, we read, and I quote, By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. Now, my pe the phrase my people throughout the book of Isaiah refers to the nation of Israel. And then it goes on, verse 9, And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, though he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. So how does that work? How can Israel be judged for, on behalf of the sins of my people, which is Israel, having himself done no wrong and there being no deceit in his mouth? That doesn't work. Um, another um, common point that sometimes uh, comes up in support of the uh, common Jewish interpretation is Isaiah 53, 8, where um, it's um, asserted that it uses the plural, lamo, um, to, refer, to refer to the, the suffering servant. Um, but lamo is also used elsewhere um, in, in scripture of, um, in the singular. So, for example, in Isaiah, even in the book of Isaiah, chapter 44, verse 15, it says it, it becomes a fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and makes bread. Also, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it and there's that word lamo uh, genesis 9 also um, and it's, it's there's another example where it says he also said blessed be the lord the god of shem and let canaan be his servant may god enlarge uh, japheth 
and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his or Lamo's servant. And so you, again, you've got that um, word used uh, not only of plural, but also singular. So that doesn't really help settle the matter. Moreover, the word is translated to singular uh, by both the Septuagint translation as well as um, English translators of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, and even if it, um, I mean, um, I'll, um, I'll, in the last couple of minutes, I also want to bring in another point, which is um, that um, when we compare the suffering servant text in Isaiah we, to uh, what we find in other texts in, uh, elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible, such as Zechariah 9, for instance, um, or Micah 5, we see intertextual parallels with these uh, texts, which are very clearly unequivocally messianic. Uh, Isaiah 53 um, is clearly talking about the same individuals we find in Isaiah 11, as, as Samuel um, argued as well. Um, and that, and of course, even, uh, even the Jewish rabbi Rashi would accept that um, I, um, Isaiah 11 is a messianic text. And so by extension, it's very difficult to argue around Isaiah 53 not being uh, a messianic text. Um, Zechariah 9 is another text, which I think dovetails and parallels um, the, um, the servant songs in Isaiah, where it says, um, Zechariah 9, verses, chapter, verses 9 through 11, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation as he, humble and mountain on a donkey and a colt full of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle of bow shall be cut off, and you shall, shall speak peace to the nations, which was one of the mission statements in the book of Isaiah concerning the servant. Um, that he establishes global peace. It's called the Prince of Peace. He, he establishes his global dominion and so forth. His rule should be from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. So there's a um, global rule that is established, which we also read of in Isaiah. Um, As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, which of course dovetails with Isaiah 53, I will cite your prison tree from the waterless pit. Also imagery that we find in Isaiah concerning the, um, the servant, if you look at Isaiah 42. Um, also Micah... Um, Chapter 5 says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me one who is to be ruler in Israel, who is coming forth as from of old from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, again, similar language to Isaiah, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, um, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure from now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Again, very strikingly similar language. And both that Zechariah and that Micah text are accepted by even Rashi as being messianic texts. And so I'll rest my case with that, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, we're now going to move on to um, uh, Yusuf. Uh, Yusuf will have uh, 12 minutes for his opening statement. So, Yusuf, over to you. Um, thank you. Let me just get my. Uh, Emma, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Well, thank all of you, uh, and thank you once again for being part of this uh, uh, good session. I think to start off with, I want to first, uh, you know, say, begin in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. I think to understand the chapter of Isaiah effectively, you need to obviously set aside some of the ways in which we tend to prejudge. Bible and allow it to speak for itself. And, you know, I, from what I can see uh, from both Samuel and Johnson's presentation, they certainly attempt to provide the context, but it seems that they haven't pinpointed and gone deeply into the, the, the passage of Isaiah 53. Uh, and of course, unpack some of the passages and verses there, which uh, create certain problems, particularly when you apply it in relation to Jesus. Now, in preparing for this particular debate, I've looked at both the conservative scholars, radical scholars, and in fact, Jewish scholars. I've looked at the works of Mitch Glazer, um, Daryl Bock, uh, and, and of course, Gerald Siegel. Um, and a, a lot of my uh, presentation and um, material will be based, of course, on their research, particularly uh, Gerald Siegel and, and some of his writings on what, what, what Isaiah 53 basically uh, entails. If you look at the prophecy and the consideration, in fact, begins with Isaiah 52, where the expression is, behold, my servant. And Samuel tried, Reverend Samuel tried to, you know, unpack the, the whole context of what servant means, who it implies, and, and so on and so forth. At the outset, a servant by definition is always an inferior position to the master. I mean, uh, John, for example, acknowledges that the servant is not greater than the master. So the sending of Jesus would have taken place whilst the Trinity uh, was supposed to be all co-equal. If Jesus is an incarnate member of the co-equal triune deity, 
He couldn't become less than the equal of the other two and still be co-equal and of one essence. So there's a problem. So seven has to be understood in the light of the passages that are generally called the seven songs in the uh, books of Isaiah. Um, the seven songs are found in Isaiah 42 to 61, which Samuel, uh, I think Shabir and, and certainly um, Jonathan alluded to. There have been many scholars across the spectrum of biblical interpretation, and they give two primary uh, possible servants. One particular scholar is an individual called Walter Kaiser. Walter Kaiser, he's a scholar from Brandeis University. He holds the idea that there are two possible interpretations. Now, he's a conservative Christian scholar, but in relation to Isaiah 53, he acknowledges and concedes that it could refer to either the Messiah or the nation of Israel. So a Messianic individual or to the nation of Israel that's viewed as a corporate whole. So I think that the, the main point is that this begs a question, who is being referred to in the individual passages? Because, you know, in certain passages, Isaiah 41, 43, 44, 48, it seems that the entire nation of Israel is referred to. But in other passages, you have something which is very individualistic. So in determining who the individual is or who the sermon is, obviously context plays a role. And in all instances, I think we need to point this out, where the New Testament uses Isaiah 53, it alleges literal fulfillment, not metaphorical fulfillment, literal fulfillment. So you cannot, for example, say certain passages in Isaiah 53 are literal, some are metaphorical. They all allege literal fulfillment. Matthew 8, Mark 15, Luke 22, John 12, Acts 8, 32. Romans 10, 16, in all notwithstanding, it always alleges literal fulfillment. Let's look at it. Yeah, let's look at an analysis uh, in the limited time I have. In Isaiah 53, 1, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, there are Christians who identify arm of the Lord with Jesus, but this claims wishful thinking because Matthew misuses the scripture. Matthew 12, uh, 18 to 21, literally applies to Jesus the announcement of Isaiah 42 that speaks of the sermon. But what about the verses in that same chapter which speak about the sermon as being blind and deaf? And it, in fact, shows the service as, as sermon as being disobedient and rebellious. Now, where does the New Testament portray Jesus as either literally blind or figuratively blind and deaf or disobedient and a rebellious sinner? It cannot and still hold Jesus as sinless. And this shows that Isaiah is, in fact, speaking of neither the Messiah nor Jesus, but of a people or a nation. In fact, if you look at the Hebrew transliteration, it's Vehu am bazuz veshasu. But he, it is a people, nation, robbed and spoiled. It clearly refers to the people of, uh, of, of Israel. If you look at Isaiah 53, verse 2, he grew up a tender plant as a root of a dry land, no form, no comeliness. Now, when Jesus was growing up, was he frail? Was he unsightly? Was he repulsive? In the Gospels, in the Synoptic Gospels, it asserted that he was tall, he was wise, he enjoyed popularity. During his ministry years, the Gospel reports are that certainly there are those that oppose Jesus, but compare this opposition to the popularity that he enjoyed whilst uh, you know, uh, going to his alleged death. You have women that followed him. You have Jews that followed him. You have Pharisees that followed him. You have large crowds that followed him. And clearly these stories contradict the description of a servant that's found in, 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 in verse 2. It says further, no form, no comeliness, no appearance that we should delight. And here we are told that this doesn't refer to a physical being, but to humility, as being mentioned by Christ, uh, by Christians. Now, the Gospels, in the in the general sense, they describe a different Jesus. He was neither a humble person. He was not necessarily a loving person. Uh, he exhibited rabid, a rabid intolerance to those who disagreed with him. He was described as being haughty and cruel in both word and deed. If you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that is quite clearly there. We can unpack some of the passages in relation to that. Uh, you have another point that Paul, in fact, makes a claim, and Christians allude to this by suggesting that Jesus somehow humbled himself in Philippians. But that humility didn't extend to relations with ordinary people who disagreed with him. Another uh, contention presented is that the verse refers to Jesus, uh, the, the Jewish rejection of Jesus' message at the time of the death. But if the gospel reports are accurate, you, you see that there's a large contingent that uh, certainly he had secret followers. On the way to being executed, Luke claims that there was a falling, a great multitude of people. There were women who were mourning and lamenting him. Isaiah 53 verse 3 says he was despised and rejected of men as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised. Now, if you look at the synoptic gospels in particular, uh, they insist that Jesus was in fact greatly admired by large uh, segments of his society. The gospels claim that not only the poor followed him, but um, they were attracted by his works. Who did the gospel say followed him? They say that the women followed him. Many of those who initially followed him were women. 
Uh, they maintained that at his crucifixion, many women were looking at a distance from him. Many of the rulers secretly believed in him in John 12, 42. Jews believed in Jesus in John 12, 11. Uh, Luke mentions that even some Pharisees warned Her Jesus that Herod was planning to kill him. Now, why would they warn him if they didn't so follow him in Luke 13, 31? Mark relates how Jairus, for example, uh, the ruler of the synagogue, became a believer. Um, so basically, it should be noted that according to the gospel narratives, the general Jewish population did not directly reject Jesus' as messianic assertions since he had not openly claimed to be the Messiah. And he goes on and says, whatever I say, I, I, I say and do in secret. Isaiah 53 verse 4, he says, surely our diseases he did bear and our pains was carried and was considered him stricken, stricken of God and afflicted. Now, the point being made is that Matthew uses Isaiah 53 verse 4 and he says this is to fulfill what was spoken that he took our sicknesses and he carried our diseases now the context means that Matthew always understood this literally but the servant in Isaiah 53 is described as someone who was stricken Nagua and Nagua in the Jewish scriptures in connection with being stricken with leprosy Nega Zarat, the plague of leprosy, as in Leviticus 13.9. And at no stage was Jesus stricken physically with leprosy. So Christians cannot claim they literally fulfilled it, even though Matthew apportions a, a, a part of this particular verse as a literal form of fulfillment. Isaiah 53, verse 5, the chastisement of our welfare was upon him, and with his wounds were we healed. And Christians claim this refers to Jesus being scourged prior to his crucifixion. But was Jesus scourged prior to his crucifixion? And if he was scourged, how did this heal anyone? And when was he scourged exactly? Because the Gospels give a contradictory report in terms of when this basically happened. When the Roman soldier shed his blood. Um, if you look at some Gospels, for example, um, John establishes that the, the inflicting of the wound happened prior to his death. Matthew's Gospel, which is now viewed as an interpolation because it doesn't appear in a number of manuscripts, state that it happened after his death. So that's clearly a contradiction in terms of the spearing. And, and, and its insertion into the text of Matthew reflects an awareness of John chapter 19, verse 32 to 34. The other point is, did Jesus fulfill the Torah's requirement for blood sacrifice? Under no circumstances can one say that Jesus shed his blood as a sin offering because Jesus did not die as a result of any blood loss from any wounds. There was no shedding of blood. Hence, by extension, there would be no sacrifice. And what, what, where is a Christian's blood atonement for sin? Because Hebrews states that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. It doesn't say without a broken heart, there is no forgiveness of sins. So if Jesus died in any other way other than by the shedding of blood, he could not be the savior that is preached in 2 Corinthians and in the book of Acts. Isaiah 53 verse 6, it says the Lord visited upon him the iniquity of all of us. And here Shabir alluded to the pre-gospel church developed Christology by utilizing biblical passages. And, and the phrase the Lord has visited upon him, the iniquity of all of us, yeah, you know, was a significant source uh, for uh, the belief that Jesus died for the sins of the world. But that, that is belied by Jesus' non-fulfillment of the entire total sum of Isaiah's prophecy. Because the, the, the New Testament teaches that Jesus literally took upon himself someone else's guilt. But the Jewish scriptures teach something else. They say only the blood of the sinner will suffice. Not the blood of the innocent in Numbers uh, 35, verse 33, in Psalm uh, chapter 49, verse 8. Isaiah 53, verse 7. As a sheep before shearers is dumb, he opened not his mouth. Now, was Jesus humble and was he silent when he was before the Jewish officials and Pilate? There appears to be a stupid analogy of uh, application here because a sheep by the very nature is dumb. Jesus was not silent. A sheep is oblivious to its face, faith. Jesus was not ignorant of his role and faith. Uh, he was not unresisting and oblivious to his death, uh, except in the latter part or in the Garden of Gethsemane. But during his alleged interrogation by the high priest, Jesus complained that he never taught in secret. Jesus argued with Pontius Pilate during the encounter and protested his innocence. Jesus is said to have complained to God about his impending fate. So what is all of this? Isaiah 53 verse 8, as a result of the transgression of my people, he has been afflicted. And the literal rendering of this verse is from the transgression of my people to them. This is because of the transgressions of the Gentiles' servant suffered. Isaiah 53 verse 9, his grave was set with the wicked. But the word in, 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 in the Greek is the lestai. The lestai was a derogatory term for insurrectionists who opposed Roman rule. So were any who opposed Roman rule, were they wicked? 
And in any case, Jesus, the, the Gospels don't say that Jesus was in fact buried with them, although he hadn't done no violence. And I want both Samuel and, and Jonathan to re respond to this because the Gospels record a number of instances where Jesus committed acts of violence. He beat up people in the temple. He caused by death uh, hurt twine. Um, he was in many instances deceitful. He was deceitful on a number of occasions. So I think in a nutshell, and I do understand I've got about seven seconds left. I haven't you know, completed the entire section of the of the discussion. If you look at the entire um, uh, length and, and, and be all of what Isaiah uh, 53 basically uh, infers, it seems to be basically suggesting the corporate identity of the nation of Israel. And the major concern and issue concerning the suffering servant, the servant has been that it refers to Christ. But it's obvious that the passage does not describe Jesus in any way because of the fact that there are so many problematic elements in relation to the sum total of the chapter when you look at it in detail and in the packet. And I leave it at that. Thank you very much. Yusuf, thank you for your opening statement. Uh, we're going to move into the uh, rebuttals now, into the first rebuttals. Um, and uh, Samuel and Shabir are both going to have uh, 10 minutes for their um, rebuttals. So we're going to start off with Samuel. Samuel, you have uh, 10 minutes for your rebuttal. Great. Thank you for your presentation, Shabir, and I'll now respond to it. Uh, you began by saying that when we, that when Christians and people come to understand the Old Testament, they bring their assumptions from the New Testament into it. Now, that can happen, but it doesn't have to happen. And what I sought to show with my presentation was to carefully take people through the whole of the book of Isaiah and to let Isaiah interpret itself. And you can do that. And I think just to ascribe the motive to me that, you know, we, we have to uh, read our own reading into it is, is not what people have to do. If you want to understand what the text says, you can go and understand it. And I want to encourage everyone to go and study Isaiah and see what it says. Y your next points were really to, to do what often happens in Christian Muslim debates, and that was to attack the New Testament and its testimony to Jesus. And there was half your talk on that. And then to attack Isaiah itself and um, and to, to, to look at other ideas there. So I want to look at this. Now, you brought up Dominic uh, McCrossan or Crossan and uh, some other scholars. And the idea that you were getting from those scholars, and I would hardly see them as orthodox in any way, um, the, 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 uh, the, their theory is that the the writers of the New Testament are taking prophecies from the Old Testament and then inventing the story of Jesus around these prophecies. And uh, the example that was given was Mark 15, verse 33, where there's darkness in the land and there's a reference to darkness in the land in Amos. Now, I just want to uh, say with this, you actually need to give us some evidence. I'm going to look at the evidence you, you do give, but just to say one has darkness in Mark and then one has darkness in uh, uh, Amos, that's not really evidence for anything. It's just simply, it's, it's actually not trying to rewrite it in terms of Isaiah 53. That would be rewriting it, Jesus' death in terms of Amos. So it's not even a reference to Isaiah 53, which we're talking. These types of scholars are dealing in speculation and that they deny really any fulfillment of scripture. The, 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 the approach you took is really denying any fulfillment of scripture. Whenever you see a fulfillment of scripture, it must be faked. And in fact, what you're doing is you're denying that Jesus could have come and obeyed the word of God, that Jesus could have read the scriptures and said, that's what I need to do. So you're denying that Jesus could have come, obeyed and done these things. We know he did this with the donkey uh, when he rode into Jerusalem. He read that in Zechariah and he deliberately chose to ride the donkey into Jerusalem so that those who knew the scripture would understand the claim that he is making. I just don't see any evidence at all that the gospel writers are making stories up about Jesus. In fact, it actually seems the other way that Jesus is obeying the scriptures, doing these things, and then people later on start to understand what Jesus is doing. I'll particularly look at um, your reference to Jesus being silent in the synoptic gospels. Well, the, the, I know scholars say this, but it's actually not true. Jesus speaks when he's on trial in all, this, in all the gospel accounts in the synagogues, and he speaks and says things to Pilate in, in all of them. Now, Luke and Mark will give different details as to, to all of the events. And so 
in some of the events, there might be a bit more speech in another, but all of them have him speaking at various times. And so it's just actually not true that Jesus is silent. He calls out in all of them on the cross. So he's speaking in all of them. You just can't say that that, that, that these that these events have been structured around Isaiah 53 because he's speaking in all of them at different times. Now, I'll move on to uh, the Old Testament. And you know, again, you're quoting scholars, and even with Isaiah 53, which in one sense, we're just trying to take it as it is and say, does Jesus fulfill it? But you're quoting scholars who are saying the verses are obscure, uh, the text has been changed and inserted later on. Uh, I, I want to say that that's not the point of this debate. That This debate is we're taking Isaiah 53 as it is, as it was at the time of Jesus, as it's understood by Jews, as I showed in my uh, presentation that the Jews understand that this is about the Messiah, to, to try to say, well, it's obscure and, and all this, it, it, it's not really the, the idea of this debate. Uh, for, for example, um, one of these scholars, and I, I couldn't keep up with all the names, was saying that the verses don't actually talk about someone dying, but just being in prison. Well, I'll just read it from verse 8. It says, he was cut off from the land of the living, right? He's cut off from the land of the living in verse 12. Uh, because he poured out his life unto death. Now, I just don't see that as being a reference to prison. I think it just would have said prison if it meant prison. Um, so I think these scholars that you're referring to are actually not that careful. And when we go and look at what they're saying, I just don't find it convincing at all. Now, I want to look at some other claims that you made, which um, I think are just straight out wrong. So, for instance, you said that Jesus... Uh, that you know that there's no evidence in the Gospels that Jesus read Isaiah 53. Well, I want to give you two. So the first one would be Mark chapter 10, verse 45, where Jesus said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So it, and this is throughout the Gospels. Here's the idea of Jesus coming as a servant to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the idea of Isaiah 53. We also see Jesus having this idea at the Lord's Supper where he takes the bread and the wine and says, this is my body and blood which I'm giving for, uh, for, for the sins of others, to pay for the sins of others, to bring forgiveness. Um, and then you also said that there's no character in the New Testament that identifies Jesus as the servant. Well, as I pointed out in my presentation, uh, God does at Jesus' baptism, the words of Isaiah 52 are uh, spoken about um, and also on the transfiguration on two occasions in Matthew, Mark and Luke, Isaiah 42 is spoken about by God to identify Jesus as the Messiah. So where am I up to in my notes here? You put down loads of loads of points there. I, I've also got Matthew 8 verse 17, where you're saying that Isaiah 53 is being applied in the wrong way to Jesus there. Well, I'm no, it's not. He's actually healing people's sicknesses. He's taking it upon himself. He's touching them. And in the Jewish way of ceremonial law with touching, when Jesus touches the leper, uh, he would be taking that on. But when he when he touches it, he brings healing to it. And so it, it's actually perfectly Isaiah 53. It's Jesus t touching and taking <coughs> on the, the sicknesses and the leprosy of those around him. But when he does it, he brings the power of God and he brings healing and uh, and life in this way. So where am I up to? Oh, you also mentioned Bart Ehrman. And uh, Bart Ehrman obviously follows, you know, the, the, the typical liberal line of scholarship. Uh, he says that it's not Hezekiah or, or oh, sorry, I think he said that, it has a, that Ehrman says it is Hezekiah or possibly Hezekiah. Well, I showed why it could be Hezekiah in that he's the son of, of David, so he could be the Messiah. But as we read his story, we see that judgment is actually going to come on Israel and that Hezekiah says, well, at least it's not in my time. So he's not the one bringing the everlasting kingdom of God. That's just how the story reads. That's just how the story reads. And Ehrman said it, it could be national Israel. Well, I went through and showed how there is the national Israel, but there's the servant who has a ministry to the nation of Israel. And so Again, I don't think it's that difficult. You've just got to read through Isaiah to see these things. Um, as I pointed out in my uh, talk, 
the idea that Isaiah 53 is about the Messiah is the Jewish idea. We saw it in the Targums, we saw it in the Talmud, and we saw it in uh, Maimonides, great Islamic, sorry, great uh, Israelite sources. And so, um, you know, I, I'm not reading my opinions into this. It's not that I'm just, I'm, I'm motivated to say it must mean this. I'm just reading it on its own terms. It's talking about two servants, one who serves the other. And so the, the servant of Isaiah 53 is the Messiah. It is Jesus. This is what we find when we just go and read the, um, the, the, the book of Isaiah itself. And so I just want to encourage people to, to go and have a look at Isaiah 53, read the servant songs, to do the work yourself, to come to your own conclusions. I don't think we should think that we have to go reading lots of different scholars on this. I think God's word is relatively clear to us. We can certainly um, listen to people. But what I do want to say is if scholars are saying things, we should also check them as well. And as I think we've seen with uh, some of these references about him not dying and being in prison, some of these scholars are actually not that careful in the way that they interpret the text. I'll finish up there. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. We're going to move to um, Shabir for your first uh, rebuttal. Shabir, you have uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend Samuel. And uh, it was delightful to listen to your opening presentation and also to your rebuttal. And so, uh, too, uh, Jonathan, it was delightful to listen to you as well. And uh, Yusuf, uh, obviously, we see eye to eye on many things. So it was even more delightful uh, to listen to you. So may God bless you all. Uh, coming back to some of the things that were raised by these uh, honorable gentlemen, I want to start with uh, Jonathan, not to pick on you, but I want to go a little bit uh, backwards in sequence here. Uh, so, Jonathan, uh, you, you say, you know, we, we shouldn't be uh, look, looking at what uh, taking the scholar's word for it. I agree with that. You know, just because a scholar says it doesn't mean that's the end of it. But remember, my point was, like, what went wrong? Why is it that you, you had it, the New Testament affirms that Jesus is the servant of Isaiah 53, and that was the church doctrine for so many hundreds of years. And then uh, we come to the modern period in which uh, many Christian scholars are saying we are Christians, uh, we believe in Jesus, but we don't believe that he is the suffering servant of uh, Isaiah. So what went wrong? And so the point is that your own scholars have been going away from that traditional belief. What compels them to go away from that traditional belief? Either we can say that Satan has gotten a hold of them, but this is a large number of people. The better explanation is that they're becoming more educated. They're looking at the history and the context, and they're interpreting both Jesus in his context and Isaiah in his context, and they're seeing that the two do not match. Jesus is not the suffering servant of Isaiah. So I'm citing your scholars. I'm not citing, you know, scholars. Well, when I say your scholars, you might say, okay, they're not my scholars. They're not conservative. And But what I've made that distinction. I've shown that, they, okay, there are conservative scholars. I know that. They're your scholars. And there are uh, uh, non-conservative Christian scholars who are educated. They're writing huge commentaries on the Bible. For them to write that, they know the Greek. They know the Hebrew. They're explaining all of that. And this is their conclusion. So uh, with all due respect to you, Jonathan, and to Reverend Samuel Green, uh, if, if you are telling me that the Hebrew means something, yeah, I may say, okay, maybe you're right. But if I'm reading it in one of these commentaries, I have more confidence in what is written in the scholarly works. And uh, and that's normal. I mean, uh, 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 Jonathan, you, you have got your PhD from scholars who were before you, and they conferred that PhD on, on you. They know the subject, and they teach you. Uh, and then you become a scholar of your own. Now, when you get a PhD in uh, biblical studies, you'll be a scholar of your own. You'll write your own commentaries on the Bible, and that will be a respected uh, work. But in the meantime, uh, like if I'm asking, like, who has the scholarship here? Like, whom do I trust more to explain to me the Hebrew and the context and the history behind all of this, what Isaiah meant in his uh, time and, and era? Uh, I'm I'm so sorry that uh, yeah yeah we're here in the platform because we couldn't bring those scholars. Uh, but when we're discussing them, we when we're discussing the issue, we can call expert witnesses, and they to me are expert uh, witnesses. They're qualified uh, and and they know what they're talking about. Now, 
let's look at one of the points that you made. So you're making these links. You're citing all of these verses, Zechariah and uh, Isaiah, and uh, we go to uh, Micah and so on. So let's take the Micah passage that uh, this someone great will come out of, uh, out of Bethlehem. So what the New Testament writers did was they tried to make Jesus come out of Bethlehem. And Matthew and Luke have two different stories which do not match, but what, what they intersect on is that Jesus is coming from Bethlehem. So is this a prophecy uh, 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 historicized or is it history memorized? It's not history memorized. People did, you know, some people, when people are discussing Jesus' origins in John's gospel, they're saying he came from Nazareth. Nobody seems to know that he came from Bethlehem. Even though they're mentioning Bethlehem, the, the Messiah is supposed to come from Bethlehem, but nobody says, ah, but wait a minute, don't you get it? Jesus is from Bethlehem. That's the missing ingredient there. So what this all shows is that the writers of the New Testament are writing later, decades after Jesus, and they are rewriting the story. It's as if like we have a whole movie already made, and then um, it shows contemporary scenes and then uh, somebody wants to insert a frame at the beginning of the movie saying this is the year 2049. Uh, so we see that and then while we're looking at the whole movie and we're saying, okay, this all looks like contemporary scenes. Like, how is this a futuristic movie? What's this year 2049? And so we realize that somebody has inserted that into the story. So similar effect is here. The idea that Jesus was born in Bethlehem does not play out in the rest of the story. In fact, the contrary, people don't realize that he's that he's from Bethlehem, um, and 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 that shows this rewriting that I've been talking about. Is this uh, prophecy historicized? It's uh, the scholars are uh, the, the the writers of the New Testament. Uh, or people before them from whom they got the tradition, uh, they looked at the Old Testament, it said that the uh, great one should come from Bethlehem, and now they're uh, 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 coining the story uh, to make Jesus appear as if he came from Bethlehem. He was born in Bethlehem by hook or crook, by one way or another, Matthew by one way, and uh, Luke by another uh, entirely uh, and, and contradictory story. So coming back now to... Um, Reverend Samuel, Reverend Samuel, you mentioned Bart Ehrman, and uh, I'm I'm sorry, I I I don't know why you mentioned Bart Ehrman. Are you saying that I mentioned Bart Ehrman, and you're just responding? I hope not, because I didn't, I don't recall mentioning Bart Ehrman in my in my speech tonight. But but it's okay, you can answer later. Um, but but if you're thinking that I mentioned Bart Ehrman, it may be that you somehow have the impression that uh, you know this is what Muslims do. They mention Bart Ehrman, but but I didn't. In fact, you remember me mentioning uh, Crossan, and you don't seem to remember the other names. But I mentioned uh, Marcus uh, Joel Marcus, with whom I debated. So he's defending Christianity in a debate with me, and uh, I mentioned Mark Goodacre uh, and. Uh, uh, Morna Hooker. I mentioned uh, Wybrey, whom you didn't remember. He was the scholar who said that, uh, you know, cut off from the land of the living could mean that the person was imprisoned. Now, uh, why are the scholars uh, interpreting Isaiah in, in this light? They are interpreting because they, 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 Isaiah has to have a meaning in his time and in his context. And what the scholars have done is to identify that second Isaiah was written during the Babylonian exile. The New Jerome Biblical Commentary makes this very clear. Uh, these are the different uh, situations that are reflected in the various writings. And what I see that both uh, you, Reverend, and and, uh, and Dr. Uh, Jonathan, what you're doing is that you're saying, okay, this verse, uh, you know, joins to that verse, that joins to that verse, that joins to this verse. And you're hardly looking at the historical context. The historical context is that King Zedekiah was the, uh, the last of the uh, Davidic line of kings. Uh, um, the Israelites were taken into uh, uh, into exile. So the first uh, 40, the first 39 chapters of Isaiah reflect the pre-exilic uh, exilic period in which there is a hope for, uh, you know, the Davidic line to continue forever. And there's going to be a great one in the Davidic line and all of that. Uh, the time when, you know, the lambs will, will lie with the, with the lions and the lions will be eating grass, which, as I pointed out in our previous debate, never happened. Uh, but, but that's what's the hope at that time. And then the uh, Israelites were taken into exile. 
lo and behold. And now they're suffering in exile. So the suffering one could be the Israelite people or a remnant within the Israelite people. So that will give you your two servants right there, the Israelite people on the whole and a remnant within uh, the righteous uh, remnant within the Israelite people. So that's two servants. Or the second servant can be an individual within uh, the larger Israelite group who could be the prophet that the scholars are identifying as second Isaiah. And while I heard a lot of uh, rebuttals uh, about, you know, it can't be Israel because there has to be two or because Israel is so bad and there is a good one. Uh, so who's the good one? Well, the good one could be the remnant, the righteous ones, or it could be the prophet himself who sees himself as that uh, figure uh, through whom uh, a lot of good will come to the Israelites. But of course, he exaggerates and uses metaphorical language, which I didn't hear Reverend Samuel address. It's a crucial point. Are we taking, and that's the point that uh, my good friend, uh, um, Yusuf raised as well. Are we taking these passages metaphorically? Are we taking them literally? If you take them literally, they don't apply to Jesus as uh, Yusuf has ably shown, and as I have shown as well in many instances. Uh, but if you take them metaphorically, yes, uh, then it can refer to Jesus, it can refer to Moses, it can refer to Abraham, it can refer to um, uh, Zedekiah, it can refer to uh, so many other persons, and it could also refer to the prophet during the Babylonian uh, exile. Uh, so uh, address this issue. I mean, how do you take the passage that says, that says basically, if taken literally, that God had a wife? Uh, no, no Jew or Christian or Muslim is going to accept that today. So either you take the passages literally and say that God had a wife in, in Isaiah 51, uh, 50 verse 1, or you say, uh, no, we are going to take it metaphorically. So if you're going to take that one passage metaphorically, uh, why do we insist on taking the rest of it uh, uh, literally uh, to make it uh, apply to Jesus who's going to die for the sins of the world. And in doing so, now you have a complex doctrine. So you're joining, uh, you know, the messianic passages with the servant passages. So you want to make it, make him both a glorified king who is God and at the same time a servant of God. So you're mixing things and you, uh, you're, you're cooking up a complex and contradictory uh, doctrine. To me, that doesn't work. Jesus is not the servant of Isaiah 53. Uh, uh, Israel could be, a remnant within Israel could be, and uh, the prophet in the exilic period could be uh, that servant. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Shabir. We're going to move on to uh, a rebuttal from uh, Jonathan. So, Jonathan, you'll go first, and then uh, uh, Yusuf, you both have seven minutes, and Jonathan, your seven minutes starts now. Well, thank you both uh, Shabir and Yusuf for your uh, presentations. Um, j just to pick up on a few points that have been brought up, obviously there's uh, a lot that's been said so far today, so I don't have time to get through everything, but just a few points that I will remark on. Um, in Shabir's opening uh, presentation, in, on the first slide, he said something that was quite odd to me. He says, um, one of his bullet points was, no objection of this passage identifies Jesus as the Messiah. Um, and he didn't really remark too much on that point, but it seems to me that uh, if... Isaiah 53 really does identify Jesus as the Messiah. That is a significant problem for the Islamic position because the servant in Isaiah 53 is said to, uh, as Samuel has pointed out, be cut off from the land of the living, which is an idiomatic expression for to be killed. And uh, that, of course, lies in the face of what the Quran says in Surah 4, verse 157, 158. And, of course, uh, Islam has no concept of uh, the uh, the Messiah as suffering as an atoning death for the sins of the world. So that I think that is a problem if Isaiah 53 is indeed a messianic text and identifies Jesus as the Messiah. Um, he argues that... Um, uh, he, he, he argues that the, the events in the New Testament were deliberately fashioned also to fit uh, Isaiah 53. And he gave a couple examples of that. Uh, Samuel Green has already remarked on the connection between Amos 8 verse 9 and Mark 15 33. Uh, I will comment also, and he threw up a quote from Raymond Brown on his opening, uh, 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 during his opening presentation, uh, where in that quote, Raymond Brown commented on the timing of the, of the Passover slaughter. Um, in, so John's gospel, according to Raymond Brown, has Jesus crucified at noon on uh, the 
day, uh, at, at the time when the Passover lambs were being slaughtered and the John invented this or deliberately uh, changed the day of the, the timing and day of Jesus crucifixion in order to make it fit with the timing of the Passover sacrifice to make it look like Jesus is the Passover. And so you have this uh, attempt to make Jesus fit with the Old Testament backdrop. Or so the argument goes. Now, this, I'm afraid, Roman Brown is just simply false, simply in, incorrect on this point. This is why you shouldn't just trust scholars' word for things, because you often get things wrong, as Roman Brown does on this occasion. For instance, um, scholar James Brandt Petra, in his book, Jesus and the Last Supper, he says, and, and I quote, Despite the widespread influence of this interpretation, it faces a major problem of historical plausibility, for according to all the ancient Jewish evidence we possess, uh, the sacrifice of the Passover lambs did not take place at noon, but from around 3 p.m. to 5 p.m., hours that are never even mentioned in the Gospel of John. And uh, I'm happy to supply the um, citations to the original primary documents if, request, if requested. Um, so that's an example where uh, we really should fact check scholars um, without uh, assuming that they know what they're talking about because they hold a PhD. Oftentimes they don't. Um, and Raymond Brown doesn't supply a citation um, and he, the, the, the primary sources actually refute that, but this is just copied um, credulously by many scholars who just draw upon Raymond Brown's work on this particular point. Um, he mentions that uh, Jesus is not silent um, during the the, uh, the trial, uh, which you would expect from Isaiah 53. I, I, the way that I would interpret that is that Jesus does not speak a word in his own defense. Uh, I think that's a very plausible understanding of Jesus being led like a, a lamb to the slaughter and this, uh, being um, silent as a sheep before its shearers are silent and so forth. Um, um, Shabir said in response to me that Matthew and Luke do not match uh, because they both look at Micah 5 independently and see that the Messiah is supposed to be born in Bethlehem. So they have to come up with a different and contradictory way of getting Jesus to Bethlehem. Um, so in, in Matthew, you have Jesus, you have Jesus family already living in Bethlehem. Whereas in Luke, you have uh, Joseph and Mary having to go to Bethlehem from Nazareth in order to fulfill the, 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 the um, requirements of the census. They have to register in Bethlehem. Um, and I think this is a very readily harmonizable um, uh, scenario because I, the, the hypothesis that I was subscribed to is that Joseph actually was was from Bethlehem. Bethlehem was his hometown. In fact, that's even implied in Luke where it tells us that um, that Joseph, uh, that, that um, during the, the census that was ordered by the decree of Caesar Augustus, people had to return to their own Towns. And so Joseph goes to Bethlehem because that was his home town. Uh, I, I think it's an over reading, by the way, to say that, uh, as, as many do, that the Romans were require, requiring people to go back to the homes of their ancestors from a thousand years earlier. And Bart Herman, for example, makes that point, but it's, I think it's an over reading of the text. I think that it's simply Joseph's hometown, and that's why he goes from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And Quite plausibly, they had already intended to settle in Bethlehem following their marriage. And so that's why it seems that they've already settled in Bethlehem. When you read Matthew's gospel, it seems that um, there's a reference to the house, for example, in Matthew. And it seems that by the time of the flight to Egypt, they've already been in Bethlehem for a good year or two. Um, so I think that's a very, very reasonable harmonization of those texts, which I don't think is is a stretch at all. Um he uh, Shabir also mentions uh, the um, uh, the possible counter interpretation such that such as the servant in his fifty three is the nation of Israel, or perhaps is a righteous remnant within Israel, or perhaps it's an individual within Israel. Um, a number of points I would I would make here. Um, for one thing, God judges the nations for their smiting of Israel because they overdid the punishment. You can find that, for example, even in the book of Isaiah. Read Isaiah ten, which describes the siege by the Assyrians. Um, or Isaiah 29, um, even, with, so even within the book of Isaiah, you see that God turns his hand in judgment on those nations that came against Israel, even though he'd used those nations to, to actually judge Israel because they overdid the punishment. Zechariah 1 makes the same point, uh, Jeremiah 30, Jeremiah 31. So I, I don't think that the, the interpretation that Isaiah 53 concerns national Israel really works. Um, so, um, he says that um, it, well, perhaps it's the righteous remnant within Israel. Um, a number of problems there too. One being, of course, that Psalm 44 is the prayer of the righteous remnant, but even their sufferings is not bringing healing to the nations. Um, so 
all kinds of problems with those. Um, very strangely, Yusuf Ismail said that Jesus can't be the savior because he didn't die by shedding his blood. Um, I'm sorry, excuse me, what? <laughs> of course Jesus shed blood on the cross. So I, I really found that to be a very strange argument uh, that Yusuf made at that particular point. So I'll, I'll finish there because I'm out of time, but thanks for your attention. Thanks very much, uh, Jonathan. Um, Yusuf, we're gonna meet, move on to your uh, rebuttal, which will be uh, seven minutes. And um, Yusuf, you're on uh, mute at the moment. Yes, yeah. yeah, sorry, <laughs> I'm on mute. Um, okay, thank you that, uh, to all of you. I, I really enjoy engaging with you. I see there's not been much response to a lot of what I've stated. So I'm going to basically start off something that Jonathan said. He said that if Isaiah 43, 53 were true, uh, were in fact true, then it would be a problem for Muslims uh, because of the fact that it deals with the uh, 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 well, alleged death and uh, burial and crucifixion of Christ. But what if it was not true? Then, then, it, then the problem is it would be a greater problem for Christians because Isaiah is not a source of authority for Muslims, and nor is the New Testament a source of uh, for, for for Muslims. And at best, even if the text in Isaiah uh, could be shown to be fulfilled in what the New Testament writers are saying, at best, what it would show is that the New Testament writers are in fact stretching the text of the Old Testament to fit the story of the Old Testament into the life of Jesus as they were in fact constructing many of these passages. And as I pointed out, that Matthew alleges literal fulfillment. But if you apply literal fulfillment to each and every single verse of Isaiah 53, it just does not fit the the the, um, the message and, and the life of Christ. And um, I'll give you one example. If you look at, for example, what um, um, uh, Jonathan was alluding about the fact uh, that, that Jesus provided no defense um, or he, in fact, defended him. He didn't, in fact, provide a defence. Um, you know, he was led to the sheep uh, as his sure as is done. He opened not his mouth. But the point being made before the Jewish officials, there was an encounter between the high between the high priest, the elders, and Jesus. Is one of a vigorous verbal exchange. If you look at all the synoptic gospels, Jesus acknowledged before the Sanhedrin his claim that he was the Messiah. The high priest says, "You know, are you the Messiah?" He says, "I am." And you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming into the clouds of heaven in Mark, uh, in Matthew, in Luke. And, and Matthew and Luke gave Jesus' answer to the high priest in the affirmative, uh, you know, with a statement similar to that which John uses for Jesus when he answers Pilate. He says, you say I am. And that's not silence. Before Pilate, he was not silent. When Pilate says, do you know that I have authority to release you and have authority to crucify you? What does Jesus say? He says, you would have no authority over me unless it has been given you from above from God. But, you know, John's Jesus is depicted as skillfully defending himself. What he does is that, the, 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 the Romans didn't care whether he was a Messiah or not. They don't care about his spiritual claims. He was basically pleading shrewdly that his messianic teaching was nonviolent. It was not of this world movement because one which the Romans needed to fear, one which they, so he's basically saying, he have no, nothing to fear from me. At no time does he humble himself. He presents a clear verbal defense before Pilate. Jesus claims that his kingdom was not of this world. He gives the impression that he would not be in conflict with the empire. Because the Romans didn't want to crucify him because he claimed to be the Messiah. He wanted to convince Pilate that he was not a leader of a seditious movement and that his intentions were peaceful. So contrary to what Christians would have us believe, the gospel did in fact say that Jesus did in fact present a strong defense before the Jewish officials and Pilate. He was not dumb before his accusers, the Jewish and Gentile. It cannot be said that he humbled himself and did not open his mouth. He declared himself, uh, he, 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 you know, he, he, John's Jesus with no sense of humility, he opens his mouth and he tells Pilate, he says, you say that I'm a king. For this I have been born and for this I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So it's far-fetched to believe that after Jesus declares he's a king, that Pilate went out to the Jews and said, behold, I'm bringing uh, him to you. You may find that I find no guilt in him. So his uh, regal reception upon his uh, you know, arrival in Jerusalem, uh, you know, it couldn't have been unnoticed by Pilate. And so this is the whole point being made uh, that is not uh, entirely correct. Um, in the issue of my servant, you know, there are a number of reasons why Jesus cannot be considered as a servant. He doesn't declare himself as a servant. Um, um, if you, for example, you know, I want to raise uh, another point that uh, uh, in reality, if Jesus is the incarnate member of a co-equal triune de deity, then he couldn't become less than equal uh, or and still be co-equal uh, at, at the same time. So this creates a, a fundamental problem. Um, all New Testament applications of Isaiah 53, as I pointed out, point out to a literal fulfillment. And the literal you know, application, 
would obviously indicate that he had done no violence, which is impossible because there are many acts of violence that Jesus did, whether you justify it or not. It doesn't qualify one as saying that he had done no violence in relation to that. Um, did Jesus suffer for the sins of mankind? Um, you know, the, the Jesus is portrayed as suffering vicariously for the sins of mankind, but there's no support for such a doctrine in, in verse 10. The verse says that the servant offered himself on behalf of others. Now, absolutely nothing is said about offering oneself for other people's sin. The verse says, if he would offer himself as a guilt offering, that's a figurative expression concerning the servant's willingness to devote himself wholeheartedly uh, you know, to the purpose of God. And if Jesus was part of the Godhead incarnate, and a supernatural being, then there was no risk of failure on his defeat. But if, if, on the other hand, he had a free will or a choice to abandon his mandate from God. In that instance, certainly you could make the claim, but he's supposed to be God in the given circumstances. Um, there was another point that was made by um, uh, Jonathan about the word Lamo. And, the, the, you know, in Isaiah 53, verse 8, as a result of the transgression, he has been afflicted, or as some would argue uh, to them, Lamo means to them, all grammarians recognize that this can be used in a singular sense. And even in the passages that Jonathan pointed out, for example, I think Genesis 9, 26, where it refers to Shem, that's in reference to the descendants of Shem. Psalm 28, verse 8, it refers to the people of verse 9. And so the translator of the Hebrew into the Greek Septuagint, he understood the use of the word Lamo when rendering Isaiah 44, 15, which was quoted by Jonathan, that it might be for men to burn. And having taken part of it, he warns himself and they burn part of it and they bake loaves thereon and they rest and make themselves for themselves God. Now, Lamo generally refers to him, but it refers to a collective noun, the servant, that is a Jewish people, not a singular individual. And so in such instances, Lamo can be translated in the singular, although it must always be understood in the plural in relation to what uh, basically it's considered in all other passages where Isaiah uses the word Lamo about 11 or 12 times. It's always used. In the plural, although in certain instances it's denoted in the singular. And um, the, the other point being made is about the shedding of blood. Uh, you know, I don't have time for it because we've got 14 seconds. But the point being made is that um, when he when he was led, you know, by his wounds we were pierced, by his wounds we were healed. Well, I want Christians to explain what do they mean when they say by his wounds we were healed. I think I've just uh, my time has come to an end. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Yusuf. We're now going to move into um, the time of uh, cross-examination. Um, and the way that will work is the full session will be 20 minutes. Um, so the first 10 minutes, Samuel and Jonathan will be asking Shabir and Yusuf uh, questions. And then the last 10 minutes, of course, Shabir and Yusuf will then be asking Samuel and Jonathan questions. So we're going to start off with the first um, 10 minutes. And, of course, that means uh, Samuel and Jonathan, you will then have an opportunity now for 10 minutes to ask Shabir and Yusuf whichever questions uh, you would like across the two of you. So over Thanks, to you. Thanks, David. Now, before you start our time, Jonathan, I assume you have questions? Sure, I, I can ask questions. Um, how, how do you want to divide the time? Yeah, so I thought, how about um, I'll ask one, then you ask one, and we'll just go through like that, and we'll see how, how it goes for time. Okay, if you want, or if you prefer to do half half, we could do that too. I don't, I don't mind. Um, uh, well, because um, I haven't done a cross examination with four people before. Um, okay. Well, I'll, I'll make us. I'll ask one, and then how about you ask one? Okay. Okay, sure. Okay, um, so my first. Uh, hang on, here we go. So my my first question to both of you is: What do you make about the evidence I put forward from the Jewish targums? Uh, from the from the Talmud and Maimonides, which shows that the traditional Jewish understanding is that it's the Messiah who's being referred to. You want me to answer that, Brother Yusuf? Yeah, Shabir, go ahead, please. Yeah. Is so uh, Gerald Sigal in his book, uh, uh, Isaiah 53, Who Was the Servant, has gone to great lengths to show that, uh, you know, when, when people are trying to show, oh, this is the traditional Jewish um, interpretation they're quoting late source, sources they're not quoting uh, things which are definitely pre-christian um and uh, more to the point uh, when we, we want to know uh, what was in the mind of isaiah 
so you're you're quoting Maimonides. That's great. Okay, so he's a great Jew and a Jewish rabbi, and this is what he said. So maybe Jews who uh, believe in him will accept. But now we want to know uh, before Maimonides, a thousand years before him, uh, uh, seventeen hundred years before him, uh, what what was Isaiah thinking? Uh, so the, the, the scholars are looking into the mind of Isaiah here. What did he mean by what he wrote? It's not necessarily what the Jewish rabbis say many hundreds of years later. It's not what uh, Jewish uh, scholars write in the tar in the Targums, uh, which are from the first or, and second century of Christianity, or in the uh, Talmud, which is uh, you know the Babylonian from the uh, sixth century or fifth century and uh, uh, sixth century and the uh, Palestinian from the fifth century. And we want to know, uh, you know, a, a thousand years before that, what did these writings mean at the time in its historical context? Sure, but but of course I'm putting them forward because they they represent how people understood what Isaiah meant in his historical context from a Jewish perspective, and, and that they do this even after the time of Jesus, I, I think is is remarkable. I mean. There's still a, a, a there a Jewish understanding of what Isaiah meant. Uh, still, I, I don't think you're getting the point, uh, Reverend Samuel. Um, if we want to know what Isaiah thought, we need to examine Isaiah in in the light of his historical context. It's not what people said hundreds of years later on, whether Jew or Christian or atheist or anybody else. Uh, yes, all of that in, in evidence is important and should be taken into consideration. But the more important consideration is to understand Isaiah within its historical context. Could Isaiah well, okay. uh, be imagined to be saying uh, that let's forget everything that the old testament said uh, the old testament said in proverbs chapter 17 verse 15 that the one who condemns the guilty uh is uh, equal to the one who uh, 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 the, the one who lets the guilty go free is equal to the one who condemns the innocent so there are two sins there and, and uh, you know could isaiah be uh, imagined to be thinking that god is committing both of these sins uh putting the uh guilt of the uh, of the guilty ones on the innocent jesus so he's letting the guilty go free and he is uh, condemning the innocent to two crimes in one. Uh, so it, it's it, we cannot imagine Isaiah thinking along these lines. It, it, his writing must mean something else that is contemporary and in line with the beliefs at his time, some uh, 700 years uh, before Jesus. Or if we take the author of Second Isaiah to be from within the Babylonian exile, what could the Jews during the Babylonian exile have been thinking? And, and I've shown from the New Testament itself that nobody was thinking within the context of Jesus and even in uh, early Christianity that, yeah, Jesus died for our sins. This is a later belief uh, that was uh, enunciated clearly enough by Paul, and, and it took time to become a widespread and popular and the Christian uh, belief. Could I make a point, uh, Dr. Shabir Samuel, with your permission, Dave? Just quickly, and I'll be quick because time's running out. There's an allegation, I understand, from that, that apparently this whole idea of it referring to um, uh, the nation of Israel was a from the commentary of Rabbi Rashi. Uh, and that he was attempting to refute the Christian understanding of Isaiah 52 and 53, which referred to as being Jesus. But if you look at the, the time of Oregon, the church father, Oregon, in his Contra Salsum, I think about 200 of the common era, about 800 years before Rashi, you find that he records that Jews, the church father, Oregon, records that the Jews contemporary with him interpreted the passages referring to the entire nation of Israel. So it's quite clear that uh, based on that particular passage, it's it, 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 it's significant to understand that the, the early uh, Christian church uh, had Jews amongst them who interpreted it as referring to the nation of Israel. And this was not something that developed much later during the time of Rashi or Maimonides and so on and so forth. I just wanted to put that out. Yeah, I better give my time to Jonathan. Sure. Okay. Um, I'll start with uh, perhaps Shabir could help me out with this question. So in Isaiah 53, verse 9, it says, um, they made his uh, grave with, um, or sorry, verse 8 first, says that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, that we then no violence, and there was no deceit in his men. So in verse 8, when it says, stricken for the transgression of my people, who does my people refer to? That could be the prophet speaking and saying that, uh, you know, or, or, or rather, uh, as, as the, the uh, scholars like Wybrey and others would say, uh, this could have been written by the disciples of the prophet 
And, and the disciples are, are uh, thinking it through and saying that the prophet was suffering uh, because of the transgressions of the Israelite people on the whole. And, and so from the writer's point of view, who is probably third Isaiah, uh, this is what second Isaiah was going through. Okay, so you would interpret Isaiah 53 as an individual prophecy concerning the prophet who wrote second Isaiah. Is that correct? I wouldn't say I'm interpreting it that way. I'm saying that that is a scholarly interpretation that comes from, you know, scholars uh, who are, uh, you know, experts and they're writing the commentaries on, on the Bible, which are sold in Christian bookshops and read by Christians. Uh, th this is not coming from enemies of Christianity. This is this is the developed academic scholarship uh, of uh, Christianity. That That is one view. And I'm saying that that view is, is preferable to the view uh, that says, let's take this servant to be a God in the flesh who is now dying for the sins of humankind. That comes with all kinds of theological problems and internal contradiction. So the simpler so, view is the one which I have enunciated. I, I want to know what your view is, though. What's your view? Well, you know, as uh, one of the scholars, Harlinsky, has uh, pointed out, um, it, like, why do we have to have a view on that? Uh, they, uh, th there are so many passages in the Old Testament that are very obscure. Uh, the, the only reason now this becomes a matter of discussion is because Christians have taken it to refer to Jesus. So if we say that it is not, that you know, this really does not match Jesus, it doesn't mean that we have to have an alternative and we say, okay, we have nailed it. This is the alternative. It, it's not necessary. It can be an obscure passage. I've already shown, and uh, uh, neither of you gentlemen have uh, replied uh, to the um, statement that, that would imply that Yahweh had a wife. Um, so are, are, are we not going to take that metaphorically? And if we're, we're going to take that metaphorically, why are we insisting that the other passages uh, in Isaiah 53 uh, and the rest of the servant songs must have a literal uh, fulfillment? Um, uh, so it, it, it could refer to a prophet at that time that is known as second Isaiah, especially as viewed from the writer who is probably third Isaiah. And uh, I, I'm not saying that is my position. I'm saying that is the position that has been enunciated uh, by Christian scholars and writers of commentaries like Wybray. And uh, to me, that is a better alternative than the, the traditional Christian uh, view on that. Okay, so supposing that you're correct, or, or that that interpretation is correct, uh, that uh, that it's referring to the the prophet who wrote Second Isaiah, who wrote after the Babylonian exile. Let, let's grant the doc, the documentary hypothesis for the sake of the discussion. Um, how would you how would you exegete the passage? I mean, what in what way does that prophet fulfill the requirements of Isaiah fifty three? In what way does he um, uh, sprinkle the nations? In what way does he uh, is he um, mm. cut off of the land of the living and he, he's um, he, he's pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, and so forth. In what way is that? Could that be fulfilled plausibly by okay. the prophet of Second Isaiah? So, uh, what these scholars explain, and I'm not an expert at uh, you know re repeating everything that that, that they said, um, but uh, in a gist. First of all, I'm glad that you brought up the uh, the idea of sprinkling the nations because uh, these scholars point out uh, that the word actually means something like startle. Uh, the nations, yeah. not sprinkle. So the idea, I see Reverend Samuel shaking his head. Uh, but but this is what's called. I didn't make this up, Reverend Samuel. You might be saying no, but you're not. You're not saying no to me. You're saying no uh, to to biblical scholars who have said this in their in their commentaries. Uh, so cut off from the land of the of the living, as uh, Wybray explained, that could mean uh, that uh, the prophet was imprisoned, and that that is a way of taking the person away from the land of the of the living. Um, and then when he is released, then, you know, this is um, vindication. And, uh, you know, how would uh, he bring healing to the rest of the nations? Uh, this, of course, is viewed through the prophet's lenses. Uh, so uh, th that's how the prophet sees himself. It may not be necessarily what we are able to explain, uh, but it could be that the prophet himself sees himself in this role and uh, that he is uh, being punished because of the sins of his people. Maybe he's being punished along with his people, but in an exceptional way. And uh, perhaps through his healing, through his punishment, he is hoping that his people will eventually be healed. Thanks, uh, Shabir. Um, we are at the halfway point in the cross-examination, so we're going to swap things around now. 
So now, um, Shabir and Yusuf, you get to um, ask Samuel and Jonathan your questions for 10 minutes. Sure. I'll let uh, Yusuf lead off. Okay. I just want to start off with something which I didn't have time to deal with in uh, rebuttals. And maybe Jonathan and both Samuel basically can deal with this. Firstly, just at the outset, and then I move on to the actual question. Would you say that Isaiah 53 is to be understood literally or metaphorically? And what exegetical model do you use? Because mm. I just pointed out that Matthew suggested that there's a literal fulfillment. So where you, uh, what's the exegetical model for attempting to interpret certain passages in literal fashion and other passages in the metaphorical fashion? But at the outset, should it be taken literally or metaphorically? Yeah, that, well, I'll give a brief answer and then Jonathan can chime in. I mean, that just comes from comprehension. And and I, okay. I can bring in the, the, the question here that... Uh, should be brought up about um, Yahweh being Israel's husband or wife, something like that. Yeah, um, yeah. Th th this comes about just by reading in context. And so when you get words where it says he was like a lamb to the slaughter, well, mm. I don't take it literally that he is a lamb to the slaughter because the word like is in there. So there are grammatical clues when you read just in simple comprehension th that and to, to, to see how to understand it. And so within Isaiah 53, there are allusions and uh, and uh, metaphors that are used, but then there's also literal things like he poured out his soul to death. You know, so I just do it by comprehension and looking at what the grammar says. So, so, so then, I, I know time's limited, but just to quickly, and I want Shabir to also come in. When, for example, there are, there are passages in the in the Old Testament which says in, in Isaiah 53 that the, 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 at the outset, we know that, the death of Jesus is supposed to achieve achieve and bring atonement. Am I correct? But what the passage says is by his wounds, we were healed by his wounds. So what is alleged to bring atonement in that passage is not the spilling of blood through blood sweating or scourging, but rather the shedding of Jesus' blood in death as an atonement for sacrifice for sin. Now, with his wounds, we were healed by extension. Would you gentlemen agree that that cannot be a reference to Jesus healing anyone at that point? Because what does with his wounds, we were healed have to do with Jesus? He didn't take upon himself the punishment that was due to us. And what event supposedly healed? Was it the scourging of Jesus or the blood loss bringing on death? You know, it said that he underwent scourging as part of the preparation. But was anyone healed by his wounds? You're not healed. It's the Christians claim that Jesus' death was a blood atonement sacrifice for mankind's sins. So by his wounds, we were healed. What does it mean? There's this problem here. Can you not see that? You're going to go, Jonathan. Go I did the last one. Sure. Um, so by his wounds, we are healed refers to the, I, I think, spiritual healing from, from sin, which is the, the real you know, spiritual disease, which is upon us, by which we are healed through Christ's wounds, his blood that is shed upon the cross. But, but but the point, Jonathan, is this, is that um, from what we understand, as Ephesians says, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. So, you know, um, uh, any suffering that Jesus underwent prior to that moment of death does not come into consideration as a New Testament blood atonement sacrifice. So not only is a scourging not in the category of blood sacrifice, but in the case of Jesus, it would have been administered prior to the actual crucifixion. And there's no evidence that Jesus died of blood loss. So when Paul says... It is through redemption through his blood that Jesus brought atonement for Christian. There's nothing else that brings or affects atonement, only Jesus' blood. And Jesus didn't die of blood loss as such. General understanding, there's no evidence for that. It's through suffocation on the cross. It, it, but, it, but the suffering, is the, the, the um, justification is through not only Christ's death, but also his suffering and his enduring of the wrath of God um, as, as he suffers on the cross. So uh, but, that, 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 to, to be honest, do you, you, accept, was, do you accept? Yeah, go ahead, Jonathan. Sorry about that. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, to be honest, I thought that was your weakest point that you brought up in the in the bit. I'm surprised you bring up in the in the cross examination. This no, was, no, but that, that was the whole point because you see, the, the commonly under, it's commonly assumed that Jesus underwent great suffering and blood loss as a result of being scourged by the Romans prior to his crucifixion. But that's that's an erroneous understanding because according to Matthew, Mark, and John. Jesus was scourged prior to the crucifixion, and Matthew and Mark relate at the end of the trial, you know, the Roman governor scourged and delivered him. But John writes that Pilate scourged Jesus in the cause of his trial. So clearly there's a contradiction there. But the point being made is that there's no evidence of blood loss as such, you know, blood, blood uh, you know, death through blood loss, which is a requirement through his blood. 
And yet there's no indication of that in the Gospels. And the Isaiah 53 passage doesn't seem to indicate blood loss. It says, by his wounds we were healed. And when you apply to Jesus, it's clearly a weak application. Um, uh, Shabir, uh, I, I don't want to. Uh, uh, Shabir, do you have any any comments to make or questions? Well, well, yeah. I mean, it's our question time, and and for these gentlemen yeah. to uh, enlighten us. So, I, I mean, if I'm to ask a question, uh, you know, as a spin-off from this, uh, both Jonathan and uh, Samuel. Uh, you know, how does this compare with the Old Testament? I, I know that it, when Muslims do a sacrifice, we cannot harm the animal. Once this animal is dedicated as a sacrifice yeah. to God, uh, we, you know, we can't remove anything from the animal. We can't injure the animal. Uh, so is it similar in the Old Testament that when an animal is going to be sacrificed to God, you can't in injure it before the, the sacrifice? And then the question of blood loss. Um, is it not normal in the Old Testament that the animal to be sacrificed, the lambs, uh, their throats will be cut and their, um, you know, as uh, to use Yusuf's term, there will be an uh, enormous amount of blood loss and the animal dies uh, in that condition. So how does the sacrifice of Jesus uh, coincide with that if, if you're going to, you know, scourge him and wound him? And, and, and then, uh, you know, moreover, like... Uh, you know, who's presenting Jesus? Because uh, a, a passage in that Isaiah 53 can be read both ways, that the Lord is offering him as a sacrifice or you are offering him as a sacrifice. So who offered Jesus as a sacrifice? Is it Christians? Is it Jews? Uh, his enemies, that is? Or, or who offered him as a sacrifice? I know I've um, asked more than one questions there, but yeah. please take okay, your time. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just give quick answers. Um, the Old Testament sacrifices are similar to what we find in Isaiah 53, in that you would lay your hands upon the head of the sacrifice and confess your sins and it would bear your sin. So that this is the, the type of background information when it talks about him being a, a, a guilt offering. It, it, and you can read that in the book of Leviticus. Now, when it comes to how they would kill the animals, they would slit their throats and uh, Isaiah 53 doesn't say he's going to slit his throat because this is a the, the, this is now using the understanding of sacrifice in an eschatological way to bring about the final fulfillment of forgiveness. So it, it's similar in terms of concept, but also different. And so it's different as we read in that this time in this way, it's a righteous servant. Um, and and so when it says he he gives up his blood or wherever it says, I, I'm trying to see where it talks about. The blood there i can't remember that verse um i think that's just like saying like that's just a normal way we talk that when you 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 give your blood for your country you you do whatever you it's just saying you died it's just a way of saying you died um i can't remember the last point now maybe jonathan can so remember Samuel, the last Samuel, point. quickly I, I don't want to interrupt did jesus die of blood loss is it your position that jesus died of blood loss well uh, to, to me that the, the question is not even relevant the, the, but the but I mean, it should be relevant no, because no. It says the blood, only the blood of the sinner will suffice where the blood of the innocent has been shed. But that, that's one aspect. But in Ephesians and in the New Testament, that has always been my understanding that, in, in fact, it's a Christian claim that a blood atonement sacrifice, we have redemption through his yeah. blood, the forgiveness of sin. So if there's no blood loss or death through blood loss, how can he be viewed as a blood sacrifice? If, for example, died through suffocation. For that particular matter. Well, well I, I would say that he's whipped and there's plenty of, I mean, we're talking about an execution in which he dies. And this is what happens to sacrifices. They they die. And that's how it's talking about this. Now, he gets whipped and there's plenty of blood loss. They spear him. There's blood loss. I mean, blood loss is happening as as, as part of his death. So I'm just not sure where to go with that. It's, it's there. But and and the fact that it's it's a, a sinner, a sinner that has to basically fulfill that 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 category of blood loss, um, of the blood sacrifice, not not a sinless individual. How well, do you well, reconcile the, the, the sacrifices of the Old Testament were always pure, blameless lambs and goats, and so they have that innocence associated. But, but, with but, but in, in Numbers thirty five thirty three, the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. In other words, the blood of the actual murderer, the sinner, can expiate yep. the crime. And so basically, from what I can see, don't you agree that the scriptural teaching has a far kind of wider application? No man can redeem, uh, you know, by any means his brother or give 
uh, he is, uh, to God a ransom for him. Each individual must atone for his sins. And the yeah. fact that the blood of him, that, of, of the person that sheds blood, his blood, you know, the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, by, but by the blood of him that is shed, the blood of the actual murderer, the sinner can expiate the crime. How can that be in the case of Jesus when he's viewed as sinless? Well, okay. First of all, Jesus is sinless, and so he is able to bear our sins. So many of the references you're talking about had, uh, a, a, like, one sinner cannot bear the, the load of another. We agree yeah. with that, right? We agree with that. We're saying that Jesus is the only sinless person, and so he's in a different category. Now then, your last point, I'm just trying to remember it now, Um uh, about the, the murderer who doesn't get forgiveness. Yes, uh, in the book of Numbers and Leviticus, when you sin in various ways, you can offer up a sacrifice for the forgiveness of your sins. And yeah. so you, you can read about those. But if you've done a capital offense, then that's not the case. And that's yeah. because you need to be put to death for doing that. But but that's not ruling out the sacrificial system. It's just but, saying but I'm, you're a murderer. I'm just confused, I'm, I'm just confused Samuel. I'm just confused on, on one point. Is that any suffering that Jesus underwent prior to the moment of the death, the crucifixion, does not come into consideration as a New Testament blood atonement sacrifice. So scourging is not in the category of blood sacrifice, but in the case of Jesus, it had been administered prior to the crucifixion and the death that eventually ensued. So all that could not be part of that sacrifice. Uh, so well, this but is it's a all whole part issue. of his death. It's part of the execution. So I, I don't know... So it's just part of the execution uh, process. But how would we wound? You see, what what event supposedly healed? Was it the scourging of Jesus or the blood loss bringing on his death, which there's no evidence in New Testament? All of it. All the all preparation of it to his death. I think all we're going to need to move into the... Um, I apologize for, for talking too much and not giving my more esteemed... Uh, <laughs> Give Dr. Shabir the time. Apologize for that. I just no, that's fine. Away. That's fine. Yeah, you were doing well. I, I think what remains is for the gentleman to answer who was offering the sacrifice. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, well, now, Jonathan, do you want to do that? I mean... Uh, well, the the so cross-examination like, time was ten? up, but we can we can do that if you want, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll, let you, we'll let you answer. I don't have a sure. problem with it. Sure. Maybe they can yeah. Yeah. answer to, to wrap we'll this give up. You, yeah. Give me a minute to Jonathan before we move sure. to the statements. So, so God offers the sacrifice. It's carried out by by the Jew by the Jewish and Roman authorities, um, the Jewish authorities by handing him over to the, the Roman authorities and the Roman authorities who actually uh, carried out the crucifixion of Jesus. So it, it's both and. Uh, God could, uh, provides the sacrifice for sins, and uh, it's carried out by by humans. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, we're going to move into the um, closing statements. So just a reminder of those again. Um, so Yusuf and Jonathan will go first with three minutes each, and then later on Shabir and Samuel with five minutes each. So uh, Yusuf, we're going to move into your closing statements, and you will have uh, three minutes. Okay. Let me just put my time on. Okay, thank you for that. It was uh, fantastic. Uh, it's always a problem getting up at three in the morning because my brain is not uh, yeah. that awake. But I think I put forth and, and, and made a strong case why Isaiah 53 cannot refer to Jesus. I know we were limited and, and had so many time constraints, but I see all the points that I had raised in relation to Isaiah 53 was not dealt with um, and, 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 and was not basically addressed. There, there were a few points about the issue of the blood loss, but the rest of the chapter where I kind of unpacked why it does not, in fact, refer to Jesus, um, both Jonathan and Samuel never addressed that. I do understand we're constrained with time. Maybe we need a longer session. But essentially what this does is that it boils down to the crucifixion. The, the New Testament's Jesus as it's presented, cannot deviate from a divine program. You know, unlike a martyr who has um, no first-hand knowledge of what to expect uh, from his sacrifice, Jesus, it is said, is you know had that particular knowledge. And if Jesus knew where he came from and he knew where he was going, and he, and if he knew exactly what the rewards would be for his obedience to the will of God, then essentially there's no sacrifice because he's God. He's in fact God. So, and the rest of the story is that. You know, the fact is that Jesus' death through crucifixion per se, you know, is actually no remedy for sin because he did not die in man's place. His death was not a ransom price paid for all eternity. His death was not sacrificed. Jesus' death was a means by which, uh, you know, the New Testament in Philippians at the very least states that he, you know, obtained great rewards for himself of which he was fully aware. 
and, and they would be his if he allowed himself to be executed. So if you look at it in the broader scheme of things, Jesus sacrificed absolutely nothing if he was a supernatural being. You know, he knew his mission. He, he knew he was going to be crucified. He knew he would be restored to life with an intact body. He knew he's going to be well rewarded for, for allowing himself to be executed because he's, he's God. And so as an equal member and a co-equal member of the triune God, he rewarded himself for the troubles. And yet the point I was trying to emphasize in, um, in Numbers 35, 33, I think that was a correct reference, that only the blood of the sinner will suffice where the blood of the innocent has been shed. The land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. And so that has that, that scriptural teaching has basically a wide application. Psalm 49 verse 8 says, No man can by any means redeem his brother or give uh, to God a ransom for him. Uh, Ezekiel um, 18 says, The soul that sins will die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Uh, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son and so on. Each individual must personally atone for his sins. His sins cannot be literally transferred onto another human being. And that's what the Quran says. Therefore, the Quran takes a corrective approach on this particular issue where it says, وَمَا قَتَلُهُ وَمَا صَلَبُهُ They killed him not, nor do they crucify him. But it was made to appear so unto them. And it says, uh, you know, no bearer of burdens can bear the burden of another. As the Quran says, as indeed much of the Old Testament says, and clearly from that perspective, you can clearly see that Isaiah 53 is a stretch by the writers of the New Testament to attempt to apply to Jesus. But as we look and unpack, it, it, it's totally more particularly referring to the corporate nation of Israel, the identity of Israel, as opposed to Jesus himself, who's clearly not fulfilled in this particular passage. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you to all, uh, David, for being such a, a generous uh, host. Thanks, uh, thanks, Yusuf, and thank you for getting up so early in the morning there in South Africa. Uh, we're going to move on to, to Jonathan for your three-minute closing statement. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen, for uh, this engaging uh, discussion about uh, Isaiah 53. Just to pick up on a few points that uh, were brought up that uh, we didn't quite get to. Um, so Yusuf had mentioned um, where... Um, during one of his rebuttals, where does the New Testament present Jesus as being uh, deaf and disobedient as per Isaiah 42? But Isaiah 42, uh, the, the, as Samuel quite rightly said in his opening statement, Isaiah 42 contrasts two different servants. You've got the servant in uh, the first part of the chapter that is indeed the, the messianic servant. And then at the end of the chapter, you have the the uh, uh, the others, the, the disobedient servant, the unrighteous servant, who is the nation of Israel, where it says, "Hear you, deaf; look, you blind, that you may see." Who is blind but my servant, or deaf from the messenger of my send? That is speaking about the nation of Israel. And so that's why there's a need for the uh, the greater Israel, the true Israel, uh, the one who succeeds where Israel filled, which of course is fulfilled in the righteous servant who is the who fulfills the messianic mission of whom we read in the the, the servant songs, including in Isaiah 53. Um, We've um, um, so we. I think we've seen uh, throughout uh, this evening that Isaiah fifty three is um, best ex best understood as as talking about the the one who fulfills the messianic mission. Who um, I think we can um, ar argue is the person of Jesus Christ. We've, um, we, when we read Isaiah 53, we find that uh, this individual was to be rejected by his own people. And that's in verses 1 and 2. Uh, he, he, he's, um, for it, it, um, who has believed what he has heard from us, for, uh, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Uh, for he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out to dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. Uh, and yet we also see in these other texts, uh, Isaiah 49, 6, Isaiah 42, 6, uh, that the Messiah was supposed to be a light to the Gentiles, so God's salvation might reach to the ends of the earth. And uh, who but Jesus has uniquely accomplished that uh, that mission of bringing representatives of all nations to recognize the God of Israel. And that's quite a, an astonishing feat. Uh, what are the chances that a messianic claimant would be um, rejected by his own people, the Jews, and nonetheless come to bring representatives of all nations to recognize the God of Israel? And so I think that uh, that that provides um, that's of evidential value in confirming the messianic identity of Jesus of Nazareth. And I think that uh, Isaiah 53 is a, is a great prophetic testament to, um, to Jesus uh, identity and, um, 
and uh, mission. And so I will finish with that. And thank you, gentlemen, for participating uh, in today's debate. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Uh, we're going to move into the concluding statements from Shabir and Samuel. So, Shabir, over to yourself. Your five minutes starts now. So, gentlemen, I'm so glad we did this. Uh, the audience out there, thank you all for paying attention to this. If you are watching us live, I know it's late night for many of you, but of course, it may be uh, a wee hours of the morning uh, for those who are in South Africa. And uh, oh, you have it good if you're <laughs> if you're in Australia, it's your daytime. But wherever you are, uh, I appreciate uh, your being with us. And uh, I want to say that uh, this has been a cordial discussion and a very enlightening one. Uh, we cited many scholars and many texts, uh, so we're all the better informed at the end. And in that case, uh, we can say that we're all winners. Uh, you know, we don't come into this to be um, uh, winners and losers. We come in to get better educated. And I'm so glad that we that we did this. Pondering some of the points, I find it interesting that uh, Jonathan, in answering the question about who offered the sacrifice, said that God offered the sacrifice. And then towards the end, uh, he um, said, well, you know, it was carried out by the Romans at the instigation of the Jews, something to this effect. But the idea that God is offering this sacrifice uh, from the inception, I think is problematic. And when we're going to interpret a text that we are interpreting Isaiah 53, we should not give an interpretation of that text, which itself is problematic. In fact, more problematic than the obscurity of the text. We've already pointed out that uh, Isaiah it has some obscurity. It uses metaphorical language. Uh, Reverend Samuel said, but uh, we can tell um, metaphor when it says as, so as a lamb. Yes, uh, that's clearly a metaphor. But then what about the Isaiah 50 verse 1, which uh, asks about this certificate of divorce, which implies and doesn't show that it's uh, uh, like the text doesn't say that this is a metaphor. Uh, there's no as there. Um it implies clearly, if taken literally, that uh, Yahweh had a wife and neither Jews, Muslims nor Christians would accept that. And that's one of the servant songs that uh, Reverend Samuel read out to us from the beginning. And uh, he, he, I don't uh, hear anyone answering, like, why are we taking that metaphorically, which we have to, uh, and not taking the rest uh, metaphorically? And when we take the Isaiah 53 metaphorically, uh, we can see that uh, this clearly refers to someone who is suffering at the time, probably uh, the prophet who is known as Second Isaiah, suffering during the Babylonian period, but it could be a remnant of Israel, according to interpretation of many scholars uh, who are Christian and who are academics, or it could be the, the, the people of Israel as a whole. And uh, you notice tonight that uh, we have cited many scholars. I myself have uh, referred to um, the New Jerome Biblical Commentary. I've referred to uh, Wybray and Norman Wybray. I've referred to Harry Arlinsky, uh, Marna Hooker, um, uh, and, and so uh, other scholars as well. I've referred to John Dominic Crossan, who I know was not well received by uh, Samuel, but I've also re referred to a modified position which was advanced by Mark Goodacre. And I said that that position itself is good enough for me. And even Marcus, Bo uh, yeah, Joel Marcus, I refer to, who debated with me in uh, Scotland many years ago, Defending Christianity, he's a writer of the Anchor Bible Commentary on Mark's Gospel, truly a well-recognized uh, scholar. And he also admits in his article uh, that uh, the New Testament writers created some uh, events uh, uh, narrating about Jesus in light of what the Old Testament said. So they, in, in order to tell us what Jesus said and did, uh, they went to the Old Testament to find out what he should have said and did according to what they thought to be prophecies about him. And then they wrote the events in the life of Jesus to make it correspond. And um, uh, so when we are looking at the New Testament, we're saying, aha, look, Jesus fulfilled the prophecy. Uh, but the background story is that the writers of the New Testament made it appear that way. And uh, just like my analogy with the movie in which somebody goes in and puts uh, a futuristic date at the beginning, and we can see that it's all contemporary, we're seeing in the New Testament that the characters who are there, like the persons on, on the ground, uh, nobody uh, gets a clue that this is uh, the servant of God uh, who is suffering uh, from Isaiah 53. And uh, Jonathan says, well, the instigation of the Jews, but the Jews uh, would have known their scripture and they would have known that by putting Jesus to death, uh, they are actually making him out to be uh, the servant of Isaiah uh, 53. 
so it's a whole complicated uh, and, and internally incoherent doctrine to say that the Jews, knowing their own scripture, are putting this person to death, but this is God's doing. God is engineering this whole scenario uh, to kill his son for the sins of the people, whereas God could just simply forgive people, as Morna Hooker uh, pointed out, was actually the teaching of Jesus. So thank you all. Glad we did this. Let's do it again. Thank you. Thank you, Shabir. And uh, Samuel, we're going to uh, hand over to you for your closing statement of five minutes. Okay. <clears throat> well, again, I, I want to thank Shabir and Yusuf uh, for being part of this dialogue and representing the Christian position. I want to thank Jonathan for partnering with me in this and David for, in, uh, for moderating and, and running the tech for us. Uh, I always enjoy meeting with these gentlemen and discussing ideas, even though we can be passionate about what we believe. We've got to have this uh, friendly, open and frank discussion. And I hope that those of you who have watched this today will have, to, will have points that you can take away to think about further. Um, I'll just do a, a couple of tidy up comments and then I'll give a summary of what I said to finish up. So um, uh, uh, Shabir uh, noted that I was shaking my head when he was referring to the scholars who said that the word in Isaiah 52 verse 15 should be translated as startled, not sprinkled. And so I was talking about how that there's priestly language used of this servant here and that he sprinkles the nations. And then Shabir was saying, well, it, it's this word startle. Well, I've got a challenge for everyone watching this. Get on a Bible program, look up what the Hebrew word is in Isaiah 52, 15, and then look at every other reference. And what you'll basically see is that every other reference before Isaiah 53 has to do with the priests sprinkling the blood. But I, I want you to go and look that up yourself because you can do that. You can check what these scholars say. Now, regarding the certificate of divorce, does this mean that God literally has a wife? No, because this is one of the ways that God speaks about his relationship with Israel throughout the scriptures. He often speaks of Israel as a wife that he got, particularly in the book of, uh, Hosea, um, the book of Hosea. And, and in the book of Ezekiel, we'll see these ideas of the nation of Israel having a covenant relationship with God. And just as marriage is a covenant relationship, that metaphor is used to describe God's relationship with Israel, that they are his wife in this sense of a covenant relationship. It doesn't mean that he literally has a wife, but it's the, it's the image of a marriage being applied in the covenant relationship between God and Israel when he made that covenant with them under Moses. Um, again, there's the idea that, um, that, uh, that that was brought up throughout that the the, the Gospels are just rewriting uh, the, the life of Jesus in the light of prophecies. And I, but my point is that when we look at these examples, they don't hold water for the evidence for this. But secondly, my main problem is you're actually denying that Jesus obeyed Scripture. You're denying that Jesus would read the Scripture and then deliberately go and obey it. And so I just think that this is an atheistic argument that denies prophecy um, and, and that God gives prophets and that Jesus fulfills it. But to conclude with my summary, today we've been looking at uh, whether Jesus is the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. We've seen that Isaiah 53 is a prophecy, not just of the servant, but of the gospel, which will be proclaimed to the nations. The, it's, it prophesies the gospel as much as it prophesies the servant. And this gospel is a message about the suffering servant who has died as a sacrifice for sins and has been raised from the dead and now provides intercession and righteousness for sinners. As we followed this theme through in the book of Isaiah, we saw that this Messiah, the Messiah is not Hezekiah or Cyrus, but the servant of the Lord. And this servant is the true Israelite, the faithful servant um, who fulfills Israel's mission, both to Israel and the nations. And we definitely saw two servants within there, within the scriptures, and that this is the traditional uh, Jewish understanding as well. Um, for these reasons, the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 is Jesus. Uh, he fulfills it through his life and his mission, and it's confirmed through his resurrection from the dead. Uh, and 
Um, I, I, if it's not Jesus, then who is it? Because it's definitely somebody dying for the sins of others to provide intercession for them. And I'll finish up with just a few verses now um, from Isaiah 53. Sorry, I should have had it ready. Um, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, but each of us has turned and each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then in verse 12, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samuel. Thanks very much for that. Gentlemen, thank you so much for this time together. It's been a wonderful time together, a great time of uh, conversational debate. Um, I just want to thank you for all the preparation that you put in. And I also just want to thank you for the respectful tone of the discussions throughout. So um, thank you to each one of you. And of course, thank you also to each person who is online for joining us for a great uh, discussion, great debate. We look forward to more of these in the future. And I wish each of you a good morning, a good afternoon, and a good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Take care.